with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, November 15th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Michael Barnes, Venice, excuse me, history lecturer at Yale University, author of For Might and Right, Cold War Defense Spending and the Remaking of America, Democ American Democracy. Meanwhile, heeding us our call on Friday, the Department of Justice enforces congressional contempt. Steve Bannon, three shirt wearing Steve Bannon, <laughs> surrenders to the FBI after a grand jury indictment. They only have one shirt in prison. We'll see about that. We'll see about that. Meanwhile, Kaiser Union uh, strike avoided as a deal is struck in the middle of the night last night would have been tens of thousands of pharmacists going on strike in texas beto to run for governor meanwhile in new york state zephyr teach out try one more time for attorney general and you won't have patrick Leahy Leahy to criticize Leahy. anymore <laughs> He's going to retire um, at the spry old age of, of what is it, eighty something? Yeah, and the front runner to replace him is seventy-five. Yeah, yes, a young spring chicken. Ah. Meanwhile, Biden to sign the infrastructure bill today, the reconciliation bill punted to December, but they're going to get that defense bill done. U.S. apparently hid airstrikes in March of 2019, which killed dozens of Syrian children. And new emails show just how much the Trump administration and Trump himself interfered with the CDC COVID response. Interesting stat, the number of workers quitting their jobs in September was the highest on record. COP26 ends with a thud, and the White House holds the first summit of tribal nations since 2016. Wonder why that is. All this and more on today's program. I'm not sure why Ronald Reagan made a, a guest appearance at the end of that, but. Why are they doing that? <laughs> uh, it is Monday, and of course, here to uh, start off the week and actually be here the entire week mm. as she is always Emma Viglin. Hello Emma. I will be here this entire week. Next week, not so much. Well, that's true. Next week is uh, Thanksgiving week as we call it. Yes, it is. So Looking that's pretty what we that. call it around here. We call it around here. Actually, during Thanksgiving week, we're going to have at a, a, a least four shows. Well, no, a maximum of four shows <laughs> and a minimum of four shows. We're going to have four shows. Just four shows, yeah. Uh, they're not going to be all live. But, I mean, and we're not going to do one on Thanksgiving. Right. But we give you content, 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 even when we can't physically be <sighs> it's here. It's ridiculous. Content machines. We're machines. Yeah. We're machines. I mean, well, that's, that's how we end this show. We reveal. That's the, that's the reveal. I'm not sure when it's going to happen. It could be probably years and years. But, I mean, it's going to be one of those things where I just... Yeah. Take off your face like a la Terminator. Mm, yeah, something like that. One of those, one of those futuristic sci-fi 
Yeah. Right. Or like fembots, like mm -hmm. awesome powers. Um, the <laughs> Sam, especially. The, the Bannon thing is, I mean, putting aside the fact that it's Bannon, the, the important thing is, is that had the Department of Justice not upheld this contempt of Congress, sent it to a grand jury, the grand jury decided, there would have been a complete destruction of the ability of Congress to perform proper oversight, not just in the context of um, people who are plotting to overthrow the government, as uh, the January 6th commission is investigating, but people who are like sort of not looking to overthrow the government, just control the government or to uh, poison uh, citizens or whatever it is. And so this is really important for, for two reasons. One, it empowers Congress's ability to investigate. Hugely important, hugely important. They need the ability to hold people in contempt if they won't come and testify. Whether it's like tobacco executives or, or Facebook executives or Google executives or, or uh, Steve Bannon and Mark Meadows. I mean, we're going to start to see a cavalcade of this. And I'm, I'm here for it. Plus, it's, I think, very important to understand what was going on and who was plotting what. Um, and the only way you explain to the American public the severity of these things. And I'm also, like, in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking about you, these, these emails that were released about uh, how the White House was dealing with the CDC in their attempts to warn people about COVID. I mean, I think there is a case to be made that there are, you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people died who did not have to die. Deborah Burke said this, said as much. Yeah. Right. Did she not exactly say that as a part of the task force that, you know, is some of her testimony? Uh, I forget exactly in which context, but I believe she said the Trump administration's policies resulted in an extra thousands and thousands of deaths. There's a difference between policies that were mistakes. Do you understand? Yes. And and policies that are set out specifically with a total reckless disregard for the lives that were going to be lost. And it is the latter. And I think that is becoming in more and more clear that they actively inhibited the ability of the CDC to respond in the way that they needed to respond to this. I mean, that was obvious. Trump was basically saying the more testing we do, the more cases we're going to find. So we shouldn't do any more testing. He only saw it through the lens of how the PR was going to be for it's himself. Better not to know. And, 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 there, and, you know, and I think there was without a doubt. And I think like, you know, there was a feeling of like, well, We'll let the, you know, maybe what they're doing is letting the old man blow off some steam. In the meantime, we're going to be doing everything we need to do. The adults behind the scenes that's, are taking care of it, right? And, and it turns out, no, the no. adults actually were being basically told, like, you can't do this. We're not going to let you warn the American public. And um, it is, uh, I mean, <laughs> this administration, I mean, talk about January 6th. That's all well and good. I would like to see, and, and obviously these CDC emails are coming out because, of, but I would like to see that committee forefronted. And I would like to see subpoenas issued there. And I would like to see, like, I, I want to talk about, um, you know, show trials. That's what we should be seeing. But um, getting back to the January 6th, um, what number was that again? Nine. Um, Senator John Barrasso, Republican from Wyoming, sat down with ABC's George Stephanopoulos uh, this weekend. And uh, George Stephanopoulos, I, I mean, I guess, I don't know how Barrasso didn't prepare for this, but there's audio of uh, Donald Trump saying it was common sense that people would be angry enough to hang Mike Pence. Now, in any other context, I would probably agree with him. I mean, obviously, I'm joking. Uh, I think uh, Mike Pence is loathsome, but I would just, uh, I would probably just jail him. I right. wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, resort to that type Make of Make him do some work. Make him uh, have dinner in a room with a woman by himself. Exactly. Just, uh, exactly. Put, just put mental torture, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. We're going to tell your wife that you ate in a restaurant full of women. Uh, what do you think about that? But uh, nevertheless, here's uh, Senator John Barrasso, unable to really uh, respond to uh, what Stephanopoulos is presenting him. Were you in a 
about him during that, that siege? Were you worried about no, his safety? No, I thought he was well protected, and I, I had heard that he was in good shape. No, you I heard those chants. That was terrible. I mean, was, you know, the... He could have. Well, the people were very angry. They were saying, hang my Because it's, it's common sense. How can you... If you know a vote is fraudulent, right? Yeah. How can you pass on a fraudulent vote to Congress? So he says, hang Mike Pence's common sense. Can your party tolerate a leader who defends murderous chants against his own vice president? Well, well, let me just say the Republican Party is incredibly united right now, and it's because of the policies of this administration. And I think the more that the Democrats and the press becomes obsessed with President Trump, I think the better it is for the Republican Party. President Trump brings lots of energy to the party. He's an enduring force. But elections are about the future, not the past. And that's what we saw in Virginia and all across the country. And the Republican policies and the Trump policies right. of a strong economy and American energy, not begging Vladimir Putin to produce more oil, which is what Joe Biden is doing. Those are policies that we're going to continue to run on in the future. So you have no problem with the president saying, uh, hang Mike Pence's common sense? I was with Mike Pence in the Senate chamber during January 6th, and what happened was they quickly got Vice President Pence out of there, certainly a lot faster than they removed the senators. I believed he was safe the whole time. Um, I didn't hear any of those chants. I don't believe that he did either. And Vice President Pence came back into the chamber that night and certified the election. Well, we just played the chance. I'm asking if you if you believe if you can tolerate the president saying, "Hang Mike Pence's common sense." It's it's not common sense. But there are issues of every election. <laughs> I voted to certify the election, and what we have seen on this election, oh, there are areas that needed to be looked into, like what we saw in Pennsylvania. We all want fair and free elections. That's where we need to go for the. Future. Well, you know, he, as he's talking, it honestly felt like someone had a um, a Barrasso, uh, John Barrasso soundboard, <laughs> and they were just struggling with the only responses they had. The sequencing was yeah, yeah. Well, they just didn't have anything to like, right. a, like actually address the question. Um, so what he says there that's most notable is Trump brings a lot of energy. Apparently. Yeah. Well, I mean, cool, right? That, then there's no reason to, t if it's in your self interest and you're able to ride it, there's no reason to actually uh, tamp it down in any way. But Stephanopoulos, I, I, I'm annoyed that he went about the chance and not the question of, is the, was the vote fraudulent or not? Because right. they're in the Schrodinger's like vote thing of like it was a fraudulent voter, it wasn't. We we eventually like let Biden win, but like ask about that. Like, do you think that vote was fraudulent? Because of, like how people reacted to a fraudulent vote. When Trump says, "If you know a vote is fraudulent," well, we don't know that. That's a lie. The next question should have been, "Well, if it was not common sense, why?" Like what? Like what? What was the underlying? Um, yes, it would be nice if they really just, you know set out to uh, really, really make these politicians um, uh, address this thing that is existing 11 months after the election. The, like our big lie. Yep. Part of the issue, too, is that Pence seems OK with all of this, right? I mean, Mike Pence isn't speaking out about this kind of quote. Yep. They're all OK with with whatever energy Donald Trump brings, uh, even if we're we're playing with fire, obviously. How how many hours a day do you think that Mike Pence practices responding to this question for the uh, Republican debates? Well, I'm sure uh, yeah. Donald is um, was my president, and he's a <laughs> quite a guy, <laughs> and uh, um, you know we, uh, we it's a turn of a phrase, I'm sure. Yes. Well, I mean, he don't he, leave me hanging. Are we sure? Do <laughs> you leave me hang? Hang me. Right. Uh, hang me as the next president. Right. Like in the rafters. Hang ten. I mean, come on. He uh, he can't practice that in the mirror though, because looking at himself in the mirror is obviously one of the seven deadly sins. Is that right. illegal? No, I, I don't know. know. I'm just I'm just trying to find fake but real sounding puritanical beliefs of Mike Pence. Yeah, I don't think that's. I don't think mirror. I have a feeling he spends a lot of time in front. Of I don't mirror. know if he even shows up in the mirror to be honest. Folks. Our sponsor today, Podium. If you own a business and you don't, you know that there are not enough hours in a day to waste playing phone tag. 
List of customers you need to reach doesn't get any shorter, especially when business is good. That's why local businesses everywhere turn to Podium. Podium makes every interaction as easy as sending a text. So everything uh, that makes your business great can get done faster. Podium, uh, Podium isn't just a better way to communicate. It's a better way to do everything. It allows you to gather reviews, collect payments, and even market to your customers. Podium makes it all as easy as pressing send. You won't just free up more time. You'll grow your business and get more done. With Podium, you'll close deals with customers before the competition even has a chance to call them back. Join more than 100,000 businesses that already use Podium to streamline their customer interactions. Get started for free at podium.com slash majority. Or sign up for a paid Podium account and get a free credit card reader. Restrictions apply. That's podium.com slash majority. If you've got a small business, check it out. Get directly in touch with your customers. Okay. I want to welcome to the program... Michael uh, Branas, he is a history lecturer at Yale University, author of For Might and Right, Cold War Defense Spending and the Remaking of American Democracy. Uh, Michael, I'm here with Emma Viglin. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, all right. So we're, you're, you're telling the story really of, of the past, I guess, uh, 80 years, uh, more or less, yeah. and the development of what... Um, I guess Eisenhower in some ways had, had warned us of was this military industrial complex mm -hmm. and the, uh, the intellectual history and the sort of the political history of it. Let's start with, you know, um, and what's amazing, we're on the verge of, of passing another um, uh, defense bill. I don't know, within a week or two, and it's just going to, it's just going to happen. We'll probably add a couple, uh, you know, 10, 20 billion dollars, which we now would refer to as like 200 billion over the next 10 years. And no one's going to bat an eye. Will, will you just go back to the era prior to the Cold War to give people a sense of how this was not always the case? This country was not, was not an empire. Uh, both sure. in terms of like its reach and its expenditure. Sure. So when the United States uh, emerges from the Second World War victorious, there, as you're as you're indicating, Sam, there's not a, a clear sense of where the United States is going to go with its foreign policy. Um, there is a sense that the Soviet Union will be a threat, uh, and communism might be a threat, but the post-war era that we consider uh, coming to be in, in, the, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, that shapes the military industrial complex isn't a given. Uh, and it's what I argue in the book, it's really liberals uh, who see that the Soviet Union is going to be, uh, an, a, as they view it, an imperial threat to its interests, both economic, that is the United States interests, economic, diplomatic, and military interests. Uh, and there's a fear uh, that the United States will not be prepared militarily, economically, uh, diplomatically to meet that threat. Uh, and obviously, the, the Second World War is looming in the background here. Uh, and to prevent another type of, of World War II, many people in Congress, but, but Democrats in particular, as well as some Republicans, get on board with this idea of its military power. Uh, at home and abroad, and needs to do so in ways that will deter a a, co a, a, a threat from the Soviet Union, a, a Soviet attack. And then, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. No, I, well, I just, I, and I also just want to mention, like, uh, um, uh, you're frozen, but we have uh, audio seems to be coming through fine, so that's okay. uh, uh, that's that's fine. Don't worry about it. If the, the, we get the video back, uh, all the better. Um, okay. But I, just to be clear here, too, like, give us some definitions when we talk about, because... I mean, I recall um, a, uh, a a time when um, when uh, you know you had uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, I think, announcing in the early '50s, we're all liberals. Um, I mean, so could you give us some def definitions as to who those people were at that time, and so that we know, like, when we're talking conservatives, liberals, Democrats, Republicans, who we're talking about? Sure. Can you Can you still hear me? Yeah, we're yeah we're losing yeah. your audio. Uh, did we just lose this camera too? Yeah, we lost the camera. Um, Hold on. Uh, 
let's see here. Let's just take a, a quick pause, and why don't you uh, disconnect and reconnect? Liberals are referring to our, our uh, you know, uh, Harry Truman, who's president of the United States at the time uh, after World War II. Um, but uh, many uh, what we call Cold War liberals, those who believe that the United States mission uh, needs to be, uh, you know, foreign policy wise, needs to be brought in the wake of, of a Soviet threat. Uh, and those liberals include people like Hubert Humphrey, um, who is a Democrat from Minnesota, who's very dedicated to civil rights and, and social justice. but believes that the United States can't carry out social justice without uh, having an expansive empire to deter the threat of a Soviet attack, which, which would um, you know, obviously thwart uh, America's global and, and domestic ambitions. Uh, and they believe that so, that, so this is the kind of the project then for many Democrats is that in order, in order to build up uh, its, its economy domestically, it also needs to build up, build up its foreign policy globally. Uh, and what this means is that you have uh, in the wake of, of uh, McCarthyism and Cold War anti-communism, uh, you have a situation where uh, many uh, liberals who are pushing for uh, uh, health care, um, full employment, uh, those liberals, as they're, as they're um, being confronted with red baiting, as they're being confronted with their own concerns that we can't uh, pursue uh, any policy that would smack of socialism, uh, that they can deliver social benefits, uh, jobs, good paying jobs, uh, even racial progress through defense spending. Uh, and so what happens is you have the- uh, let's, let's stop there for a moment, because that, sure. I mean, this is really sort of the, the fascinating, um, maybe the unintended consequences on some level uh, that, that we see from this era. So where is, like, so where are conservatives situated here? Where are Republicans situated here in the wake of World War II? So if I hear you correctly, you have like, you know, um, uh, uh, liberals who are both, are they both concerned about um, expansion, uh, or I should say uh, fighting the Soviet Union, fighting the Cold War, and providing uh, material benefits at home? And, and and we'll get to that story in a moment about how the mechanism for them to provide that material benefit, sort of like, how can we dovetail this um, right. in there? Where, but where is the conservative and and, um, and and Republican sort of a stance on this? And how much, you know, how much are they cornering the liberals on the um, the Cold War hawkishness into that corner? Or how much are they just simply there with them? So you have uh, divisions within the Republican Party, divisions within conservatives uh, in general in, 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 in the early Cold War. So some Republicans believe that the United States needs to uh, have a military, have a, have a presence globally, but that it has to be limited. Uh, and they're particularly keen on the Air Force. People like Robert Taft, who's a Republican from Ohio, 
uh, would not be considered an isolationist by any stretch of the imagination, but believes that the United States can't be building toward what he would call a garrison state, right? A, a lot like military bases, which is basically almost, you know, to a certain extent what we have, military bases around the world, uh, a, 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 an employment uh, pro program that is, relies upon defense spending, defense of plans throughout the country, building weapons, that's not good for the health of the democracy or, or um, uh, in, in Taft's major concern, the health of the fiscal health of the nation. So there are those Republicans like Taft, but there are also those who are more nationalist Republicans who uh, believe that communism is a, is a threat internally and globally, and, and they're willing to, to do what needs to be done to spend uh, certain amounts of money, but, but more in terms of ideologically, do what needs to do, do what they need to do to stamp out communism. At the same time, what's happening though is that you know liberals are pushing for uh, these big changes to government, and then the conservatives uh, are are red baiting the liberals who are saying, well, if you're looking for these big changes, you're, you're 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 this is this is reeking of socialism, and so they're they're trying to play all sides of the Cold War um, to a certain extent. They're saying, well. You know, liberals are spending too much, but we also need to spend more on the Cold War, but we can't spend too much. And so what happens, I argue, by the early 1950s is that Republicans and Democrats kind of come together in this bipartisan, bipartisan consensus that really shapes how we think about Cold War spending today. Can, you know, can, you know going, to, going to your point about the fact that there will be an over $700 billion defense budget that's passed uh, it, you know, in the coming weeks. And that'll be a bipartisan project. Uh, and as you said, no one will blink an eye about that. That's This is where this, this moment kind of occurs in this bipartisan consensus is, is in the early years after the, uh, the after World War II. And just to be uh, clear, so the, the essentially the deal is um, we will all support this Cold War and the Cold War will end up being a sort of mini welfare state that we yeah. you know this will this is this is how we can get our um i don't know our iceland or our finland or whatever it is our scandinavian uh, social democracy we're just going to call it the military yes to, i mean so so um that's the default right when you can't get what you want on health care when you can't get what you what you want on employment or when you can't get a, a welfare state that is what many European countries, as you're alluding to, like the UK and France um, and Scandinavian countries are building towards. When you can't get that in American context, what happens is uh, defense be kind of comes the default. It defen defense jobs create um, good paying jobs when they're many, many, many cases unionized uh, and provide people with a, a not always, but um, a stable uh, livelihood. Uh, and they, those, if you're talking about unionized jobs, you're talking about good health there, you're talking about living in good neighborhoods. And so defense spending becomes a project of social and economic uplift for many Americans, but particularly for those who, who are um, the top income earners, those who, who have the, the, the education and, and the capabilities to, to make the most from this, um, this sort of economic regime. And how much of that came from the 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 draft going by the wayside where conservatives saw an opportunity i mean how deliberate was it to provide an alternative to the social safety net created under the new deal um and under lbj as well later i guess moving into the 70s and such to to mm -hmm. to say okay we can provide an alternate vision uh and one that kind of promotes american militarism yeah, so uh, the well, the draft ends in 73, 74, um, the, the transition to the all-volunteer force. And there's um, a good book by uh, a historian named Jennifer Middlestadt who focuses on the military welfare state, which she calls, the, she focuses on the army and says that really if you look at the army and the benefits that the army is providing in the wake of, of the draft, it, it's, it's, it's akin to a European welfare state. Um, part of that is, is, I mean, so that's in the, the act of enlisting in, in the army, enlisting in the military. You, you get uh, you know, uh, money for education, you get money for, uh, for living stipends, things like that. But um, so that project is in tandem with mine uh, that I'm looking at in the book, which is by the 70s, the mid 1970s in particular, what starts to happen within defense spending within the military industrial complex is that the best jobs, the good jobs go to the elites, right? So you have this decline in working class, a decline in a manufacturing base. Uh, and what that entails largely is 
the scientists, the engineers, those with PhDs, those with good paying jobs, reap the benefits of this uh, larger transition uh, towards austerity or, or neoliberalism. Uh, and so what you have are two things happening at the same time. Right? So you have the, the, the fact that people are, are going into the military, trying to find uh, jobs after they leave the military, trying to find uh, benefits from the federal government. But at the same time, uh, this is a project of working class uplift, but then those who are benefiting from the defense industry do so um, in, in very smaller terms. But it's 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 one that we have to sort of examine in in the larger decline of the of, of the working class and and how the defense industry contributes uh, to this larger problem. All right, so I want to I want to just put a pin in that the the um, the sort of if I understand correctly too the, the same, uh, like the parallel of there being wealth inequality developing in non-military society and in, in civilian life and also being exacerbated by um, the the essentially the training and the stratification within the military as people exit the military I want I want to but I want to go back to the 60s uh, and in the 50s when when was there a sense and we're talking about like people like Galbraith, and um, and others, and obviously uh, uh, politicians at that time, as they were under, you know, and uh, how conscious was this deal that they were making of like, we can't get, you know, like how, w w was there a plan in their mind? Like if we can introduce the idea of a GI Bill, right? Which is basically like free college um, and, government-run health care and um, full integration, racial integration, and, um, uh, you know, housing. If we can introduce this in the context of the military, it will eventually bleed into the rest of society. Was that like the thinking or was it, I mean, what was what was the thinking of, of that? And was there some type of like timeline? I mean, was there anybody who said like, you know what, we were wrong 10 years ago uh, at one point? Uh, I, I, I didn't see any sort of deliberate decision making in my research. So the, 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 the real problem that uh, in particular Democrats confront is that um, they get pushed out of office um, by 48, 49. They're, they're not a, a dominant force in Congress. Um, and by the 1950s, you have a Republican president um, and he, that is Dwight Eisenhower, as much as he's a critic of the military industrial complex in 1961, uh, he in the 1950s is a critic of government and government spending overall, but um, allows the defense industry to flourish uh, in many parts of the country. It, the, the defense industry expands from the North going into the South and into Texas and into California. Um, and so what happens is that you have a situation for, for uh, many people, um, Democrats and Republicans, uh, in Congress, that is, who see that their constituents are clamoring for jobs. They, they, want, they want the jobs that, that were there during World War II, good paying jobs through defense. Um, they uh, see during the Korean War in particular that there are jobs going to certain localities in certain places. Uh, that aren't going to their that aren't going to their districts and their towns. So they're lobbying various officials. Um, people are lobbying various officials in Congress uh, that then is is putting pressure on Congress to to generate jobs, generate larger employment through the defense industry. And so when you have this decline of of the larger social welfare project um, that really doesn't emerge until the new until um, LBJ and Great Society in the 1960s. By that kind of time, it's too late. You know, where defense has kind of taken over as a, as a large sector of, of employment uh, generating growth in, in the United States, uh, and you've got a hollowing out of the welfare state due to McCarthyism and due to anti Cold War anti communism, and so it, it it becomes this normative way of how we think about politics. And but by the time we get to the 60s and 70s, there's no political vision left to consider how we could move away from militarized economy in any way. And, and many of those people who were campaigning or arguing for that, people like Henry Wallace and 48 and others have, have um, gone out of politics or they're, they're just, they've, just, they've died. Um, so that that failure of political vision that really gets picked up by the new left and, and the anti-war movement in the 60s, but um, fails for reasons maybe we can get into, but 
um, that by that point, it, it's kind of too late. The transition has already occurred. I mean, it's uh, it, in many respects, an incredibly tragic story, right? I mean, it's just sort of like you, you opened up a Pandora's box and now it's over. You, you right. it, it, There's no, um, well, let's, let's talk about what happens as we go into the sixties and there's an attempt to push back on the militarism, um, in here. And, and I should also just say, I think there's a good point to note you, I think it's in the, I, I don't know if it was in the introduction of the book or, or uh, early on in the book, you talk about Chris Dodd and Sam Gageson yep. and, uh, EB, um, and the electric boat. I, I, I went to school in, uh, new London, uh, Connecticut used to watch, um, uh, general dynamics used to watch these nuclear subs go up the river. I did some work, uh, for Gageson during it, which was still during the cold war. And then we see the transition. Uh, I mean, I, and I wasn't around, uh, by the nineties, uh, in, in Connecticut, but, um, we see the transition of Gageson from and Dodd from someone who is arguing against Ronald Reagan's expansiveness of the Cold War, or at least maybe maybe just rhetorical. I don't know if it was actually like it was pretty expanded by that point anyways. Um, and then by the 90s, after um, uh, Reagan is gone and the, the wall has fallen, they've got to worry about the sort of material um, deprivation or benefits that are going to come that you know that happen with that do we still need the the same nuclear subs uh that we needed when there was a soviet union and somehow they come to yes <laughs> um just because there's a lot of jobs associated with that and there was you know there was a lot of economy in that area around that mm -hmm. yeah uh, I, 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 no, I mean, I think that's 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 the story. I begin the the book with the end of the cold, end of the Cold War. The the end of the story is the beginning of the book because you, you're right. We enter a period where there really is no need. There's a talk of a peace dividend in in the late '80s and early '90s at the end of the Cold War, uh, and you start to see you know Democrats who are, as you're saying, critical of, of Reagan's Central American policies, critical of, of the SGI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which is this, you know, Star Wars, which is this missile defense program that just goes nowhere and just generates a lot of money and jobs for defense contractors. They're critical of these projects, but when it comes down to uh, actually eliminating uh, elements or, or, or relics of the Cold War in their districts, uh, nuclear submarines at Electric Boat and, and, and other places, you see Democrats flipping, and, and this is one of the reasons why I think this this institution is so powerful because it it, out, it outlasts its its uh, presumably its its interest, right? Its its security interest. It doesn't. It serves a larger purpose for uh, generating employment in a time of austerity when people are are looking for jobs, looking for benefits, and the government is not providing them, and corporations obviously aren't providing them in the ways that that um, that deliver uh, uh, the jobs that are needed in the country. So. This is a part of a large, larger story of the, of the relationship between domestic and foreign policy in the, in the wake of the Cold War. Was it, was it, I mean, I imagine it was both push and pull, right? I mean, that has left us, if, if we were to map all of the military industrial jobs in this country, physically map them, they would be sort of like just spread across the country, almost like you, you would, you know, uh, I don't know, put cream cheese on a piece of, uh, uh, on a bagel or something. They're just like all the way across and, yep. um, and, and distributed that way. Was that both push and pull? In other words, was it like Congress people saying like, we've got this, um, you know, they, they want to build, uh, you know, some uh, uh, defense hawk wants to build a um, a helicopter. Well, I'm going to the company, you know, uh, uh, Gruntham Northup or whoever it is is building this. I'm going to go to them and say, like, you got to put a plant in, you know, my uh, my district. And if you do, you got my vote. And then some other congressman says, well, we'll make the rotors and you, you guys will make the and, and and that's how it works. Right. It's like a sort of a push and a pull. Yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, I think you have certainly, uh, as the as the Cold War uh, defense industry is forming uh, in the fifties and, and and sixties, you have a very deliberate effort by uh, particularly people, uh, Congress congressmen. They're they're almost all men uh, in the fifties and sixties 
who are clamoring for defense contracts in their district. There's one, there's one famous example of a, of a congressman from South Carolina named Mendel Rivers, uh, who had the nickname of Rivers Delivers because Rivers was you know, the key, the key um, proponent of defense spending in his district in, in, in South Carolina. He was you know, um, just advocating for more military spending, more military uh, defense plans, more, more bases, uh, to the point that one of his colleagues said, Mendel's, if you put more, one more military base in your district, it's going to sink into, into the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. So there's, there's actually, there's, there's a, there's a deep um, uh, need, desire for politicians to benefit from this. But of course, as you're saying, well, then these jobs come in and then people, it's a zero sum game, right? Like you get, you get a defense contract for this part, um, but you're not, that defense co contract when it runs out, when the you know the the machine or or part or a plane or whatever is built, uh, then that contract is limited, and people want the contract again. And then people who are are benefiting from that lobby their 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 representative lobby uh, you know uh, write letters to the president um, even, uh, and looking looking to get what they had back. And uh, then when it's a zero sum game too, you have people saying, well, people like Men you know, Mendel Rivers, he's getting all these defense contracts. What about me? And they're they're looking to also benefit from this as well. So there's there's a, an effort by Congress to bring defense into these districts. There's then a pushback from, from people on the ground who are benefiting from the defense industry, whether they're employed by it or not, if they're, if they're serving coffee or, or you know, um, working at a store that's frequented by defense employees, then, then they're gonna benefit from this too. They're pushing back for more. And so it's, it's this zero sum game that really um, shapes how we think about politics and the way that defense spending and foreign policy uh, affects our lives in these material ways. And and so as we enter into the 60s and uh, the early 70s, there's there's a pushback. There's an anti-militarism, at least in this country. Um, but does that have any material impact on how we spend money? Um, and I mean, is there do we ever get a contraction in in this uh, in, a, in a sustained way during any any period since we built it in the 50s? Not in the sense of of um, the there is there are dips there are ebbs and flows to defense spending. So in terms of GDP, for instance, defense spending never never is equivalent to um, what it, what it was during World War II. It was when forty three percent of GDP, um, and then the Korean War it goes up to seventeen percent of GDP. Um, Vietnam it's nine percent of GDP, and, and now it's about four or five percent. So in terms of GDP, it, it's never equivalent. Um, and I take that into account in terms of how I think about defense spending as people aren't benefiting economically in the same ways that they that they were during World War II and they're trying to get that back. But in terms of the actual increasing of the numbers of the defense budget, it, 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 it doesn't go down in any significant way. In fact, it keeps going up um, in, in terms of the actual numbers. Now, of course, the, the current um, you know, fiscal year defense budget um, is, is over $750 billion and it's the largest it's ever been. Um, so it, it, ha it, has, it doesn't go down. But the, the new left in the 60s and the anti-war movement, what it does is it doesn't necessarily affect the material circumstances, but it draws attention to the ways in which this, the military industrial complex produces waste uh, and inefficiency and uh, you know, can, can be a contributing factor in terms of, of maintaining a, a Cold War economy and, and uh, Cold War foreign policy in certain ways. Uh, and you see in Congress, uh, for the first time really during the Cold War, uh, Democrats and Republicans too, to a certain extent, feeling that they need to cut certain programs. programs. Um, they need to cut these uh, planes that, that aren't necessary anymore. They need to, uh, you know, there's this, there's this one uh, plane called the C-5A plane that has the size of, has the wingspan the size of a football field. Um, that's producing waste. Lockheed almost goes bankrupt in 1971 because of that. Uh, and there's this overwhelming critique of the military industrial complex that, that shapes how we think about defense spending. Um, but what I argue is that by the mid 1970s, by 73, 74, when there's an, uh, an overwhelming crisis in the economy uh, produced by many reasons, but inflation and 
uh, through a lack of oil production and, and there are other reasons too, but um, and unemployment, uh, then you have a greater clamoring for the defense industry to bring back jobs and, to, and for people who are employed by the defense industry to keep jobs. So the new left doesn't has this has this real uh, and, and the anti-war movement has this real uh, key moment and, and, and forceful moment in, in shaping American culture in the, in the late 60s and early 70s. But it doesn't make an impact materially because it, 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 it can't do that within this larger growing creeping uh, context of austerity that the country is facing in the early 70s. And and then we we head into the '80s. Ronald Reagan, of course, is um, you know uh, there's a whole new sort of era of militarism. Although I also remember you know there was also like we just paid uh, seventy five dollars for or you know like a hundred or two hundred and fifty dollars for a hammer. That was like the big. Um, that was the 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 sort of. This is how we're going to deal with the military. We're just going to change the procurement uh, or, or we're going to make it look like what we're doing is cutting down on waste as opposed to the entire thing is wasteful. Yeah, I mean, that's well, that's, that's you know, the, the famous, you know, what, like five thousand dollar toilet seat or whatever it was yeah. um, in the Pentagon. You know, I think and then that's that those that that's the the point, though, is that the cost overruns are endemic to the industry. Like that's the, it's it's supposed to function like that. That's a product of of the privatization of, of military spending. You know, there are some people, you mentioned Galbraith, like there are some people like James County Galbraith who said, well, we should just nationalize the defense industry, just take it over and then get these private interests out of, of the business of war. And then you can really determine when national security is necessary to, to you know, or, or when you need to produce certain weapons for national security reasons, right? Which arguably during the Cold War are, I mean, are certainly limited, right? And I think, and I think that that's one thing to think about. But but is is the, how these industries sort of like you know extract funds from the Pentagon, uh, and there's no oversight, right? There there still is no oversight in the Pentagon as much as there's been calls both by Republicans and Democrats to create some sort of, of watchdog group that could uh, see how the defense industry is is just you know taking money from from taxpayers. Uh, and spending it on these ridiculous programs like, you know, I mean, the, the F-35 is one example too, right? This is this big example of, of, of a plane that's being produced that is not going to, you know, overall benefit national security interests and we're spending billions of dollars on it. I think uh, if there was some sort of democratic accountability for that, then you, then you would, you would, you would obviously have, have, um, greater push on the industry to, to change things and for the Pentagon to change things, but there isn't. And I think Reagan is, is one of the reasons why there isn't that, that um, you know, those institutions created, why those people aren't, don't exist to, to actually challenge um, the power of the industry. Is 9-11 the other reason? I mean, because we're, we're 40 yeah. years out now. And I mean, if I was to meet a stranger, you know, if, you know, if an alien was to come down and say like, yeah, no, we had this massive buildup of, um, of our military because uh, the United States was afraid of the, the Soviet Union. And, uh, and then one day they were gone, like literally. And so what did you do with all that money? We just kept spending it. We just kept trying to find a new, a new, like we just, we had to find a new, um, we had to find a new, a new big bag. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I mean, that's what's amazing about it is the, the sort of the durability. There was that brief hiccup where it was like, we're going to have a peace dividend and people were talking about we're going to recalculate the GDP. I remember there was that movement that was like around that time in the early 90s. And then, I don't know, Bill Clinton just is, is consumed by uh, his scandal and their the politics seemed to go away. I mean, or, or just people get excited about Y2K and then uh, we're on to 9-11, um, uh, it feels like. Yeah, nine, I mean, 9-11 is, is a transformative moment. I mean, there's, uh, I think, I mean, what's really interesting to me is, I mean, 9-11 obviously changes defense spending in the military industrial complex and how we think about war in, in obvious ways. But, you know, in the 90s, there's this, you know, question, as you're saying, of what do we do with this military? Like, what do we, what do, we do with, with these um, programs? What do we do with um, these bases? And there is, by Clinton, some 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 measure limited, but to close military bases, there there are some bases closed in California and converted, to, you know, to, to to shopping malls and things like that. Um, but what you start to see in the 90s, and I didn't get this too much in my book, but I've written about this in other places, 
um, and there are other scholars who are writing about this as well, but is, is the transferring of Pentagon uh, equipment to police departments, right? This is the 90s is what do we do with this and the militarization of the police. You get the 1033 program in 97. Uh, you get the Budget, Budget Enforcement Act in 1990, which prevents defense funds from being allocated to social welfare projects. Um, you know, all, all this sort of question of like, what strategically do we do with this now we don't have this enemy? Um, and that, then we should obviously consider that in the context of humanitarian intervention and, and other, other um, questions that, that arise from America's involvement in like places like Somalia, and, for instance, and, um, you know, and other parts of the world. But anyway, you know, this to me is really interesting and shapes the coming of 9-11, right? The 90s, the militarization of the police, the militarization of American culture, the militarization of American society, where you start to see um, our, our, our police departments looking like, you know, having tanks and looking like they're prepared for war. Uh, and then 9-11 happens, and then you have the, the creation of the Homeland Security Act, the Homeland Security Department, that's um, going to shape how people uh, in, in the national security apparatus go after uh, suspected terrorists. Uh, and, and, you know, the 90s, I think, is this key formative moment that, that transforms defense spending both at home and abroad and, and, and really comes to shape us in ways that we I don't think we've really reconciled with uh, yet, uh, now that we're supposedly emerging from the war on terror. But, you know, that's, uh, I well, think, let me, a bit overstated. I mean, this is, let me ask you a really unfair question. <laughs> but like, let, I mean, you know, it's one thing to sort of during that era, we're, you know, we're really talking about from, you know, an eight year period, right? Uh, from the fall of the Soviet Union to, to 9-11. And there is a, there, you know, there is a sort of almost like a scurrying around to try and figure out how we're going to respond to this. You've got the the neocons, you know, talking about their project for New American Century and, uh, you know, developing the idea of this sort of lighter, um, you know, uh, military that can go in and stoke low level conflicts so that we can continue to maintain our hegemony as a hyperpower and allow all these low, low level conflicts sort of keep everybody busy. Um, absent 9-11, how sustainable would that have been? I mean, because it, it feels like, you know, you can get away with the, 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 the fumes for, you know, a decade maybe. But at one point, uh, things are going to, people are going to look around and go like, wait a second. Why are we spending $600 billion maybe at that time? I don't remember exactly what it was. But, but, but why are we spending hundreds of billions of dollars a year with this? And uh, there's no enemy i mean i there was a probably an attempt to you know, sort of build up uh a china as some type of but but certainly not you know in the early aughts i just don't think we were there yet where we like do, do you think that that could have been a time of reckoning and and i ask only because you know how far out do we need to be from these incidences till generational change starts to ask questions that 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 you know mm -hmm. That Joe Biden couldn't possibly ask because he's living in a in a in a completely different era. I, I'm actually more optimistic about substantive change, you know, now than than I ever was. I mean, um, yeah, I I think what you've seen with the response, the public response to the war in Afghanistan, what you've seen with um, the creation of certain organizations like Quincy and and there are others. Uh, people who were liberal, like liberal uh, internationalists, hawks on foreign policy, questioning their premises. I mean, albeit limited, but still, um, those signs are 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 good. Um, I think if you don't have a 9/11 to go to your original question, I don't. If you don't have a 9/11, I think what happens is you get another sort of you know 10, 15 years of of the 90s where you get. Uh, larger uh, concerns over humanitarian efforts, like humanitarian intervention, right, in the wake of Bosnia and 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 uh, other efforts. I think there's a, you know, George W. Bush is not, uh, as a president, is not keen on you know, overall, if there was no element, reducing America's military presence abroad. Um, I think you'd still find ways in which, or he'd find ways in which uh, American forces could be deployed and, and kept in, in, in bases throughout the world. Um, but I think what we've seen in, in the wake of 9-11, of we've seen, it, which I mean, arguably which Afghanistan and Iraq turned into is quote unquote humanitarian wars or human, wars for humanitarian intervention to prevent, um, you know, to, to create democracy, even in the case of, of places like Iraq, um, you know, in the backlash to that, I think that that really is a, is a 
um, yeah, it's a formative moment, I think, when when people realize that project is 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 uh, ill fated. It's not going to work, and maybe we should start thinking about how we spend mil how we spend money on the military and where we uh, send our forces. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm concerned that clandestine operations, special okay. forces operations, will continue, but um, I, I'm uh, you know that obviously the drone campaign will continue, but uh, I, I think there's there's an opportunity now with an American society and with the mass security apparatus to really start to think um, how we don't how we don't need this in the same way. I mean, spending in the same way. But does the impetus? But it has to come hand in hand with expanded social um, welfare programs. Because there, I mean, this is almost like it's almost like the Green New Deal, right? Where it's like, um, if we're gonna, I mean, it almost feels like that the we need to have the you know in the context of a uh, of a um, you know cutting uh, you know dealing with climate change, we need to have jobs that are waiting for people who would otherwise go into coal. We need to have a whole new um, you know. Uh, uh, jobs or, or, or some type of production of whatever it is, windmills or uh, you know, solar panels or, um, uh, you know, civic core or whatever it is. Like we need those things. They need to be shovel ready on some level before we can contract. Right. Or, I mean, I'm just talking from a political standpoint. If, if I understand what you've written here in terms of the way it developed, th these things have to happen in concert. Yes. And that, that, and also that the defense industry can be used to develop those things, right? I mean, you have all this investment and and uh, political will into creating this national security state for employment, um, but there's also been a, a you know a project to convert defense spending to peacetime purposes, to civilian purposes, and this is like basically what AOC and others have talked about is is like using defense contracts or, or things that would go to pe the Pentagon for peacetime purposes and reallocating the defense workforce. There's already a significant portion of the defense workforce that gets involved in these civilian type projects like that, that deal with climate change. Why not just you know reallocate those things? And I think the failure of, of Biden's imagination, political imagination is, is that you know he is saying, well, we need social welfare. We need um, infrastructure spending, for instance, as a key example to compete with China, right? But this is, this is why it's needed. It's, it's, it's to, to make sure that China doesn't quote unquote eat our lunch. Um, whereas others, myself included, would say, well, why do we have to have those two things being the case? Why do you have to have a justification for domestic spending in foreign policy terms and in international terms? Uh, why do you have to create an enemy to, to do that? And I think uh, many Americans would argue that you don't need to do that, that, that the, really the concern is at home and creating jobs at home uh, and using what we already have at our, at our disposal, which is this vast industry um, that creates jobs uh, to, for these peacetime purposes, for these civilian purposes, and a Green New Deal can be part of that, and, and there, but there could be other um, measures as well. Uh, and there's been activists out there who are already thinking about this and, and, and been mobilizing around defense conversion for, for decades now, and they should be um, called upon too uh, for this effort. It, it'll be nice when we don't have politicians who were literally raised in the Cold War and who have still yeah. have this mentality. All right, lastly, let me just ask you about this, this aspect of, of, of wealth inequality. Um, which you 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 began to to talk about how we we have these parallel tracks, you know, as we all of these things happen as we sort of like our economy becomes much more neoliberal, and that that enhances the need or the expediency of providing social social welfare through the military, which grows the military. Uh, and then the military itself also enhances wealth inequality because of, you have two tracks of people who go in, people who come out of, uh, of the military who are uh, trained to go into positions where they make a ton of money, um, and then others who are not trained and, you know, end up just um, getting stuck at, in sectors that have absolutely no growth in terms of, uh, well, so where are we on that accord? I mean, to me, the, the, the problem is that defense industry actually, yeah, as you're saying, exacerbates inequality, and that's not that's not um, changing anytime soon. Um, the The demand for innovative uh, technology to compete with China that's not going to demand a manufacturing base in the same ways that that you know I think um, you know would entail uh, you know during the Vietnam War or during World War II. Um, maybe I'm wrong on that, uh, but I, I I think that you have um, 
you know, this, this larger hollowing out, as I said, of, of the welfare state and people who are going and getting jobs, going looking at the military as, as, a, as, a, as a place of, of mobility, that's not going to change anytime soon. Those incentives are still going to be there. Um, but looking through the military as a, as a, to, to create employment, I think that as many politicians say that they're doing, like this is why they need to keep these jobs. They need to keep these jobs because if we don't have these jobs, then people are employed then, and then you know, we're, all, we're all going to be worse. When we talk about jobs, they're not meeting jobs that, that um, blue collar families, you know, um, uh, that working class families are, enjoy. They're talking about jobs that, that go to a certain sector of the, of the population that, that's um, largely the economic elite. I think that has to be taken into account when we hear somebody say, well, let's create jobs um, through the military. Like that's, that, there's been many studies on this. And one key study by Brown University in the Cost of War Project that shows that the way that we create jobs through the military is inefficient. And I think that creating less incentives for people to um, fight to fight wars through through, through a, so this welfare state or getting access to a welfare state to fight wars, I think, um, is is going to entail as as you as you said earlier, a project that creates. That, that that the government creates jobs for for people in, in the working class so they don't have to go and fight wars um, to go to college uh, or to um, have a stable livelihood um, I think uh, the, the the way in which we, we figure out that equation and tackle that um, the, the, the relationship between inequality and, and military spending I think uh, is, is going to shape um, how we conduct ourselves both at home and abroad and um, we'll see how that how that takes form but um, again I'm encouraged. Uh, now than I, than I ever have been. Well, uh, I'll take that. Uh, for might and right, Cold War defense spending and the remaking of American democracy. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm. Uh, Michael Brennas, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right, folks. Majority Live. Majority, Majority Live. Live. Majority Report Live. Uh, dot com. Either one of those is We're where you go. We're going to recreate January 6th. That's right. Teenth. January 16th, Boston, Massachusetts, the live show. We're going um, to slowly roll out who we uh, were having to, the, to, to there. Some massive names. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say that. Steve Bannon handing himself over to the authorities really... Through a wrench in our yep. in our booking process. And was supposed to. Well, whatever. We don't know if he'll be available um, anymore. But uh, folks, you got to get your tickets now. Majority live um, may have sold out. Like, uh, there's still good seats. Let's put it this way. There's still. I mean, the Wilbur is a great theater. Uh, if you wanted to get really close to the stage, I don't. I mean, uh, but it's it's an intimate place. Um, and so, uh, get your tickets now. Because you don't want to be sitting in the storage rooms. Let's put it that way. I have to project really loudly. Exactly. MajorityLive.com or MajorityReportLive.com. Also, don't forget, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member today at JoinTheMajorityReport.com. When you do, you not only support the free show, you get extra content. And there's even more of that where that's coming from. We're developing some stuff on the uh, app, which is going to be member only stuff. Mm. Yeah, we're all we're going to get into it. You know, now we get the we've unshackled ourselves. Mm. We're drowning in only one pool now, as opposed to the two pools of of largesse that we were associated with. Right. We were like, big Comcast is now gone. Oh. And uh, yeah. and we have more time now to uh, concentrate on those things, although I have been sort of like chilling a little bit recovering from yeah those months it was a lot of work um swimming in two pools swimming in two pools yeah simultaneously i don't know, even know how you do that mm. i built a tunnel in between the pools <laughs> and i okay and um <laughs> also just coffee.coop fair trade coffee tea or chocolate use the coupon code majority get 10 percent off you want to i am the show go to majorityapp.com majorityapp.com uh jack sunmuns says oh jackson muns says the audio on the app is always quieter compared to youtube i have to crank it up on the app and it's still not that loud interesting well we appreciate the note we will uh, probably fix that so. we will fix that get a lot uh a lot more where that came from 
in the uh, fun half of the program, ladies and gentlemen. Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Uh, yeah, David Griscom and I, for uh, Left Reckoning patrons this weekend, talked to one Aaron Kowalski from Nebraska Kowalski wow. about uh, all things farming, the future of farming, the current uh, predicaments of farming. We talked a little bit about that IP stuff, uh, talked about land use, talked about where we need to go for climate change and how we can get bison um, and do some land back stuff in the middle of the country um, as a way to... Kowalski's got a good some good in, interesting ideas like it's like um greenhouses near urban uh, areas where you can get the labor e more easily and uh we'll do this thing where i can't remember exactly what vegetation you plant but it pulls carbon out of the environment and then you send that down the missouri and Missi mississippi and then bury it under concrete and it's basically like an organic way to uh take carbon out of the atmosphere so interesting it's got some interesting mm. ideas so patreon.com slash left reckoning for the first uh, left reckoning farm report all right, folks, see you in the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Who sent us this? Alpha males are back. Back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, back, back. Snowflake says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, wow, what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. nightmare. bring back to DJ Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break time. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? 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 A hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> a hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 black, When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are black. Back. Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. What? Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. I am a total. We are back. Back. Let me read this. Uh, I am right away. This is important. Uh, just as a, we haven't addressed this. Uh, on a policy level, and I want to apologize for that, but just as a as a fair warning, ban and cellmate, I am Sam. Please help. Someone in the chat is claiming that I'm so fertile 
that she got pregnant by reading one of my comments. What does the chat policy uh, say about this? We don't really have a policy on that. I mean, we don't, we don't, we, we. On positive fertility comments and on virility or fertility? That we are, we are fertile agnostic on this program. Now, maybe that's something we have to revisit, but we allow fertile, infertile, super fertile, I don't know what other categories there are. We also don't maintain a chat policy. The, it's like, kind of like the British Constitution that we never really wrote it down. It just develops over eons. That's right. It's, it is, it's a living, breathing non-document is what it is. So just, I just want to make that clear. It's a living, breathing CD-ROM, right? S CD-ROM. That's where, that's... Right, uh, correct, yeah. correct, yes. Yes, I know what you're referring to now. I had almost completely forgotten what you were talking about. Uh, folks, the number is 646-257-3920. If you want to be a part of this program, to call in. Of course, you can also be a part of this program by IMing us. Uh, and you can do that through the app, majorityapp.com. Uh, COP26 is not getting very good reviews. Um, either... Neither in terms of commitments by uh, countries to inhibit the um, the releasing of carbon emissions, nor in providing reparations, if you will, which I think is really, I mean, that's the most accurate way of of describing it. The the country the wealthier countries in this country in this world have developed their wealth at the expense of poorer countries in this world i mean i know this sounds a little bit remedial but i think people need to hear it and aside from that which i think is a sort of a more of a, a you know colonial reparations and other types of reparations the development of uh, our economies has produced more CO2 emissions. These CO2 emissions have warmed the planet and have created all sorts of, of catastrophes that, um, you know, end up costing lives and uh, money. Uh, and, and in some respects, sometimes can be existential for some of these countries. And they need our support we need to um you know they're dealing with our externalities is really what mm -hmm. it comes down to in terms of their uh, their uh, our profit making um aoc was speaking last week in glasgow um they had yet uh the the, the final agreement was not there yet so maybe people were a little bit more hopeful but she had two comments which i thought were worth uh, hearing in terms of like what the united states is doing yeah, those are in, in order, right? Yeah, let's do the first. America is back at COP at, and on the international stage as a leader in climate action and drawdown. One thing that I think is so exciting about this time is that when we say that the United States is back, it's not just that we're back in the way that the United States was pursuing climate policy before. It is different. And I would argue that it's a fundamentally different approach. Now, uh, I think she got a lot of critique on that because it is... Um, Inaccurate. Sounds like a car commercial. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and um, sounds a little bit optimistic. The, there is not a fundamental hostility towards the idea of dealing with climate change that is expressed by the United States yeah. as to whether we will have a material uh, difference in our actions that remains to be seen. Um, but at least, it, you know, it, it could be just as much like we're bad. We're paying lip service again, whereas before we did not. Now it could change. It could change. I mean, there's uh, the, the, the Build Back Better bill has a significant amount of money dedicated to climate change. Is it going to be uh, to, to at least, uh, you know, diminishing our emissions? Is it going to be sufficient? No. 
Uh, but she did at least also say that, like, yeah, um, we need to just let me just qualify what I said earlier about the United States being, um, you know, that great. We may be back, but we're not really where we should be. No, we have not uh, recovered our moral authority. Uh, I believe that we are making steps, but also kind of in reference to the earlier question, we have to actually deliver the action in order to get the respect and authority internationally to get the credit. Uh, we have to draw down emissions to get credit for being committed on climate change. It's really that simple. I mean, I, I heard uh, someone, I can't remember exactly who it was, uh, was interviewed and said, you know, this is like basically what COP26 did is they said, like, we're setting up the helpline. And uh, the downside is you call the helpline and no one picks up. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I don't, you know, and I, she clearly she walked back those comments there. So maybe she even understood that she went too far in the first, like, uh, comment. But I just don't think it's helpful to aggrandize what is happening at COP26. Because we have Jeff Bezos speaking there. And then you have activists like Greta and... Uh, other representatives of like the youth climate movement who are banging on the doors trying to get in. Um, there are youth climate activists who are sleeping in, I think, old homeless shelters in um, in Glasgow who were met with kind of some aggressive action there by police forces there. And domestically, AOC has been conscious of, I, I think, the, the kinds of action taken against protesters um, here, but sh not showing, I think, a ton of awareness with the first comment about how disconnected everybody in that room is from the the protesters outside, which, like, you know, yeah. I, I think is important. That's the big problem. I mean, that's the problem. I, the reason I don't get super upset with, uh, like, the lack of heroic action from AOC is because I don't think, like, the movement energy is there to really um empower these the squad like we'd want them empowered but and for exactly that reason is why this is such a problem for me you can't be the one of the people that greta thunberg is talking about that's basically gilding this um piece of crap that we're not talking about any things we need to be talking about and i, I think you can't be contradicting that message for nothing for, yes, to say exactly. like to say yeah. what moral authority have we ever had to recover like uh, like the thing is yes we do need to do things that's frankly all she should have said like if we want more moral authority we need to do positive action for it and it's uh, when you but that's the problem is you can't contradict those movements in my opinion but i think it's fair to hold her to the standard to be the voice in the room that represents somebody like greta i mean that's how she's she's right that's why she's yeah, not herself. saying is that right. that, that, yes. that she right. needs to um, she needs to make sure that she is following the parameters that have been set by the people who are protesting outside in terms of, um, so that their demands are not in any way sort of, uh, sanded down or because then what do you condition their complaints are not you hold the down. line for that. Yeah. What's, what's AOC conditioning a section of her base to look at Greta being like, all oh, these people are unrealistic. That's just not, <laughs> that's not a good thing to that's be right. doing right now. That's and, right. And I don't actually think she believes that, but like, you know, it's, it's just to say the United States is back just because we're in the room is of it is feeding into the optics of doing nothing, which is what the Biden administration wants. Honestly, like I mean, it's it's not it's not helpful to claim that just being in the room is in any way close to sufficient because it's not. <laughs> uh, let's go to the phones. Calling from a two one zero area code. Two one zero area code. Not see nothing. Let's see. Maybe that's a that's it could be a me problem. Well, wait a second. All right, hold on. Let's try another call. Hold on, caller. Try another. Oh, wait a second. I know what's going on here. This happens to him. Mm. I have it. Two one zero. Good afternoon, Sam and Emma. This is John from San Antonio. You know, John from San Antonio. When you call in, there's always two 
calls from 210. It's weird. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, All great, right. great, uh, great okay, sharing so that with you. John, long time no hear from. How are you? Yeah, two weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, I uh, opened my election preview uh, with the special elections from the 20th uh, Congressional District in Florida. I was hoping that Sheila uh, Shafilis uh, McCormick was endorsed by a brand new, brand new uh, Congress and supports Medicare Care for All and the Green New Deal would win. And uh, that was expected to be a tight race on the night of the election. Her closest competitor, Broward County Commissioner, the Alhonas, kept switching leads with uh, Shafilis McCormick triggering an automatic recount that was held on Friday after the election. And after that, uh, Shafilis McCormick uh, had a five-point lead. Uh, then election officials had to wait for the, the overseas ballots. Uh, the deadline to receive those, those ballots was last Friday. And in the end, uh, Shafilis McCormick won by six votes wow. and will face a Republican op uh, opponent in January in a district that Biden won by 55 points and the primaries in Florida are next August for the 2022 race. Uh, uh, when so is when, Fridays ago? I'm sorry, wait a second. Someone wrote an uh, IM. John, John. Yes. When is that? Um, when is that? Uh, that general election? We should say this is the Alcee Hastings uh, seat. Right. Um, it's in January. I don't actually don't okay. have an exact date. I mean, this is going to be relevant, right? Because, you know, this is just like one less Democrat in the House in terms of, like, you know, I guess all the, uh, you know, that that's if they ever do get, like, the Build Back Better uh, bill going, that you're going to need that vote. Right, right. And it's also, uh, I mean, all, all the House... The, the, all the people that were nominated by Biden, all those seats will be filled. We'll actually have a full house now. I mean, Republicans already had the people that were killed by COVID. You know, they've already had their elections and other people who resigned. And so now the, the house will be full. And we should be uh, we should be clear. You're not being flipped there when you say that there was a couple of Republicans who uh, passed away uh, that's with COVID. And we're just one of the. Right. Well, one, one in Louisiana and one in Texas. So. Okay. Yes. So uh, two Fridays ago, someone wrote an IM uh, and talked about the about the Greg Cesar, who is running in the 35th district of Texas. And you said we should have a run uh, a rundown of progressive candidates running in the 2022 Democratic primary. So I'll provide you with some of that rundown. I agree that the, with the IM or that the 32-year-old Cesar is an excellent candidate and is favored to win the race. Cesar is currently an Austin City Councilman. He's been endorsed by mainstream Democrats like uh, Mayor Steve Adler and former State Senator Wendy Davis, as well as all of the top progressives in Austin and San Antonio. The district Cesar will be running in is currently being represented by Lloyd Doggett, but due to the growth in population in Austin, a new district, the 37th district, was created, and Doggett has decided decided to run in that district. The 35th district was changed slightly, but it's still a heavy Democratic district that runs in Austin to San Antonio. Representative Eddie Rodriguez, a Texas House a congressman who represents uh, Southeast Austin, is also running. Cesar's raised over $100,000 in the first three days after announcing and uh, has over 500 people showed up to the three campaign appearances in San Marcos, San Antonio, and Austin on Saturday. The Texas primary is a mere three and a half months away on March 1st, and all of the primary, and as the primaries get closer, I'll, uh, closer, I'll be talking more about progressives running across the country. Uh, I'd also like to challenge you, Sam, on some of your electoral strategies that you're espousing. Well, uh, you said that... Okay. <laughs> You said that negative partisanship should be the main point that Democrats should use, and uh, specifically tying Trump to the Republican Party. And I agree that it should be used to degree. It certainly didn't work uh, in the Virginia governor's race, where McAuliffe depended too much on talking about Trump. If you look at the history of the use of negative partisanship in the Trump era, it's had very mixed results. Uh, Clinton's main focus of her campaign was uh, – Trump was not fit for office, and she lost. 2018, Democratic congressional candidates changed their strategy and ran against the Trump tax cuts and the fact that Republicans wanted to eliminate the ACA. Uh, it's true Trump dominated the news and was very unpopular. 
and he was definitely a motivating factor in driving a record domestic uh, democratic turnout, but strategically focusing on issues worked better than focusing on Trump. In 2020, uh, Trump was, was back on the ballot, negatives and part, partisanship, drove Biden's strategy, and he barely won in the Electoral College. So you want to comment on, on some of the things? Yes, I do. I want to make it clear that, the, that Clinton did not follow what I was saying. Partisan, negative partisanship is not just negative Trumpism, right? Like the, one of the biggest problems that, that Clinton had, in my estimation, was that she completely coddled and protected um, uh, uh, the Republican Party. Yeah, but I can't even remember his name now. Paul uh, Ryan? Yeah, Paul, Paul Ryan. Ryan. Oh. And Mitch McConnell, for that matter. And you, you're you not doing this successfully if you are sending this mixed message that they're sending. We need Republicans, but, you know, Donald Trump is bad. Uh, dude, <laughs> Donald Trump is Republicanism. You need to tie those things together. And, and so, as an electoral strategy in 2021... The Democrats should be doing this when it comes to uh, January 6th. They should be doing it in terms of when it comes to like the CDC in particular. Like we, the the amount of publicity that has been given to these uh, emails that came out. It's one Politico story. Like, are you kidding me? This should be uh, every every Democrat who goes on television should be holding a copy of one of these emails saying. We have lost 750,000 plus Americans over the past year and a half, coming on two years. And 100,000, maybe 200,000 of those Americans could still be with us. It's 200,000 American families. It's 200, you know, you're talking tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of people who have lost uh, uh, children or parents or cousins. or in, and, and that should be... Donald Trump and the Republicans should be tied together. Um, and McAuliffe was not successful. I mean, I, McAuliffe was a bad. McAuliffe was a bad candidate in a myriad of ways. And it wasn't just that his strategy didn't work. It is that like the guy couldn't execute for anything and it was just was just bad at all of it. If you ask me, you don't say in the middle of this parents shouldn't have a say in their kids education. I mean, uh, that's just absurd. Um, and 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 to a certain extent, there was also a failure, a broader failure by Democrats. Youngkin was able to run away from Donald Trump. And I don't know that one individual candidate can tie someone to Donald Trump. There has to be groundwork laid. There has to be. And that's also, you know, when you're talking about incumbent uh, Republicans, much easier to do. So I am not convinced that um, that McAuliffe's strategy or that strategy, as employed by McAuliffe, was wrong. I, 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 I'm not. I mean, I just think McAuliffe. Well, I mean, when Biden, when Biden was there, also, you know, he did the same thing. That's all he did was talk about Trump. The whole, I mean, the whole conversation. I mean, I didn't watch it myself. I'm, I'm relying on press reports because I can't really hear, you know, hear Biden speak. I mean, he's too, too annoying. But uh, I mean, from the press reports that I read, that's all. That's all he talked about. Also, in in Virginia. So, I mean, I, right in Virginia. And you know, the, the sad thing is that people, you know, as much as we want to think that you know Trump and the Republican Party, you know, they're all they all should be tied together. I mean, I don't think that that's really the case as far as voters. Are well, concerned. I understand, but that's, but the, that's the problem. Yeah, that's the issue, right? I mean, how was someone like Hillary Clinton able to represent the entire Democratic Party for a while? And the, that's the Republicans working and laying messaging groundwork for that to what, happen. What is the message that you think going into uh, the midterms, John, that Democrats are going to be able to promote? Well, I mean, considering we can't pass anything. Right, it's, right. It's hard to have anything. Right. But, I mean, yeah, the inundation by mainstream media of, of you know, just com completely – I mean, and I, I agree with you. I mean, it's it's a shame, and you look at – you look at like the biggest stories of 2021, and you know you definitely have you know all of the deaths you know that are that happened in COVID, this Republican extremism, and also the failure of Biden to pass you know his programs. 
a, a you know built you know triple B. It, I mean, those are the main. And frankly, stories. frankly, I think that even if Biden was to to pass the, as it is now, or even if he was able to have passed the three point five trillion, I never felt like you would get the benefits associated with that. I'm sorry, it's just like. The American public is just not, you know, doesn't understand their one-to-one uh, relationship. You need to make their situations better. But at the same time, like, look, we just had record number of people quit their jobs in September. Now, it's possible that all those people were, you know, uh, making over $100,000 a year or whatnot. But I don't think so. I think that's indication of a, a, a very good economy of people having funds that were distributed prior to. I think we're going to run into real problems soon, but and which is not to say like we're having massive number of evictions. People have running out of their unemployment. But I think I, I there has to be a message and one for voters who are just not that plugged in. Um, you can make the argument that in a special election, off-year election, McAuliffe wasn't able, and, and, and Donald Trump stayed away from that election big time. But um, you, you got to tell me what they're going to run on. What are they going to run on in the midterm? Well, what do you, don't, don't you think that the, the John, mainstream media John, in who are you? Are you John Barrasso, or are you John from San Antonio? <laughs> I mean, it's it's tough to run on something I, you can't pass anything. I agree with yeah, what you're saying yeah. though, about about you know the American public and how fickle it, the American public is. You and are I mean, it's, it's, you are being extremely evasive, John. Well, no, I, I told you that it's it's hard to it's hard to run on I, something I, when you I, can't I, pass anything. Yeah, exactly. So what but, should I mean, they run can, on? You can still well, you can still talk about. You know your vision and how unfortunately people you know i don't know if it's just two people that's the main focus but you know how they don't they haven't been able to you know so let me let me say so so candidate john from san antonio is going to run on we couldn't get it done we still want to no we still have we still have a vision the in the future it's a vision thing in the future John, right, right. John, well, what, what the progressives get... running on? That's what that's what progressives run on all well, the time. I understand the progressives vision. need to run on that, but I'm talking about the Democratic Party. I'm talking about like broadly speaking, you know, I, I think that's a great thing to run for, uh, run on in the in the primaries, and to you know knock other Democrats out of the box. But you know, I just am not, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have any any um, a, a, any plans. I mean, of course not. No, and and you should have an ideological uh, component to this. Um, but if you want if you want to win in a general off year election, you're going to have to you're going to have to motivate people to vote. Now, maybe part of it is like you know going to be what's happening with abortion is going to be a big part of it. Maybe, uh, but it has to be that the Republican Party is this way. You need to define them, and Trump is a perfect mechanism in which to define them. And so, uh, John. You can go tell John Barrasso and you like your little learning annex where you don't answer questions. Mm. You just sort of uh, like a on. filibus. Come on, man. That's the way it is. Appreciate the call. Okay. It was great to well, talk right. to you. Don't be a stranger. Okay. Love the chit chat. That's uh, John from San Antonio, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Yep. yep. He's very smart, but he you know comes at me hard. Uh, he's prepared. Oh yeah, no, he's very prepared. I mean, that was actually sort of like that was like a like a. A, it was like, a rare it was like an off speed uh, yeah. off speed pitch from him. Mm. I just happened. He used to, he just sort of let let that sit out of the plate. He'll he'll be back with a vengeance. Yep. I'm no. I know he's gonna he's gonna inflict some pain on me after that. He's gonna go back into the archives. Um. The interesting thing is going to be going forward, based upon that bipartisan infrastructure bill vote. If somehow the Democrats manage to get the reconciliation bill passed, I, I, I mean, you know, it's really going to come down to Joe Manchin and whether Joe Biden is willing to like begin investigations of his daughter. <laughs> but we'll see. But if they get that reconciliation bill passed, 
it's going to be interesting to see how many of those 13 Republicans who voted for the bipartisan bill retire. There's already like two or three, three right? Three, three. 13. Three out of the 13 have already uh, announced that they were retiring. That's why they took that vote. This could be number four, Fred Upton from Michigan. And Fred Upton is this sort of like an odious Republican that, that Joe Biden, um, I believe, campaigned for. And so he gets this bipartisan vote. I mean, who cares? He's not going to vote for the bill back better, I don't think. Um, but that's just the way conservatives and Republicans wouldn't like the bill back better bill. We'll get to that in a second. Here is uh, Fred Upton on State of the Union on CNN. Um, we'll see if he's going to retire or not. I don't think the votes are there yet. A good number of Democrats had demanded and, and are going to receive a CBO report as to whether is it really paid for. What does it do when you expand Medicare? What does that do to the solvency? And, you know, Joe Manchin asked the question about inflation. What is this going to do to inflation? Uh, I can remember talking with Larry Summers a few months ago. He was very worried about the spending oh. uh, by the Congress and what it, in fact, was going to do to inflation. So I don't, somehow I don't think we're going to get these answers to necessarily get the, for Pelosi to get the votes uh, before the end of the week. And we also know that this bill is going to be widely different from what the Senate ultimately may do. Not a lot of days uh, in the legislative calendar yet. All right, so here's Fred Upton just basically saying what, uh, you know, uh, has been announced. We don't know what the CBO score is. And of course, what's bizarre is if he's so worried about this uh, deficit spending and about inflation, how could he have just passed the bill that we just passed? Well, but this kind of spending is going to be the one that causes inflation, not the spending that I like. Good thing Joe Biden was out there campaigning for this guy, more or less against the Democrat. Ah, oh, well, he's a part of the healthy Republican Party that... There it is. There's the Republican Party we need to be healthy and strong. Um, About to run like a uh, with his tail between his legs because he took one vote on a on a basically an expanded highway bill. So inflation being the new deficit hawkery, I don't know how much that la how long that lasts, but it probably lasts long enough for it to be convenient for Mansion and without a doubt, all he like needs is for two more kill. months. Yeah, um, it's so dumb, and they're. It's aided by the media clutching its pearls, hate to use that phrase about inflation too, because they have inflated the uh, sense of doom coming from this temporary inflation period. I mean, the bottom line is, to the extent that inflation is really hurting people, it is exactly the same people that all the people worried about inflation are willing to deny Earn child tax, uh, 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 you know, a child tax credit, and extended unemployment benefits. Um, those two things right there. Those two things right there. To the extent that there are people and the eviction moratorium, and student loan payments. If you're worried about how people are dealing with inflation, you deal with those four things. And there is no problem. But like this is like when Henry Kissinger says democracy is another country. They, the only inflation they're worried about is wage inflation. Yeah, exactly. And they're, they are worried about, banks in particular are worried about the value of debt decreasing due to inflation. I mean, that's part of it as well. There's been something like over $800 billion returned uh, because of inflation to debtors from creditors. It's like, a, you know, maybe it's temporary for right now. But that worries uh, worries them as well. And yep. I'm sure, I, I don't know Upton's campaign contributions, but that wouldn't shock me if that's at the top of the list of his concerns. Now, look, we have heard, and, and there's a lot of legitimate um, questioning of, of Jayapal. In fact, I am of the mind that it was a mistake for Jayapal to hold that uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill. But... Um, particularly now. At the time, it was, you know, w we'll see. It seemed uh, the wrong thing to do, but maybe they had some different uh, interests. Now, and, and again, and, and to be fair, I could be wrong, uh, depending on what we end up getting, ultimately. But And we also don't know what was going on behind the scenes. I mean, again, the thing that bothers me most is her basically saying publicly that she got 
promises from Gottheimer and the moderates in or the centrists, which means nothing if Manchin's going to exactly like, exactly. And and she had the leverage. But here's the bottom line: is that's a valid critique of uh, progressives who are coming and 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 good for uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Oh right, because she went on and uh, she had a. I don't know if I would call this a similar critique of uh, the Build Back Better uh, bill. Here it is. The it's got to be from progressive the left, stalwart. Right? right? It's got to be a critique from the left. I said it was Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. She endorsed Bernie. Guys. Yeah. Here she is. She is. And, and, the, and the thing I like about this is she's going on Fox to set them all straight about oh, it. Yeah. Tell them things they don't readily yes, hear. Yes. You've got to hit a wider audience and let them know why we need um, elder care, why yeah. we need parental and paid leave, why we need uh, a Green New Deal, why we need expanded Medicaid, n Medicare, yeah. not just for, uh, you know, the, the numbers of people, but also in terms of the services. And what better place to go than Fox and deliver that message? Yeah, the, the you, audience Tulsi. is older. Play the, play the clip. Yep. Here's the reality with the bill that they're continuing to push forward is that our government is too powerful and too big, even as it is, and this bill is only going to make matters worse. Uh, the provisions in the bill are so vague that really it's going to be unelected bureaucrats who end up deciding how these provisions are implemented and no accountability. Uh, and, and really it'll empower them to be able to stick their noses into every aspect of our lives, furthering this, this cradle to grave mentality of government dependence that makes us lose even more of our autonomy as we are paying for it. As government gets bigger, our wallets are getting smaller. Oh my God. <laughs> the winds really changed directions, didn't they? <laughs> Cradle to grave. Where have I heard that before? Oh, I know. Every right winger in this country has been saying that. Like Rush Limbaugh. Oh, wait a second. Where's that part about as the government gets uh, stronger, the people get... Where have I heard that before? Every single right winger. I mean, you know what, it, what I find sort of just sort of fascinating about this is like, why so slow? Like, this is not a, this is not, this is not a, like a, you know, she's not like some type of, um, what do you call it? One of those like, um, uh, huge military, like, uh, the, with the, with the, the jets fly off. It was like, like a what the aircraft the, carrier. Yeah, yeah. She's not an aircraft carrier. She doesn't need like, you know, 24 hours to take a left turn coming out of the the harbor she could she why is she just like slow walking this who's she fooling you mean her her heel turn yes i mean she took a nice leisurely heel turn where she got to uh, go obfuscate who the real leftist uh, primary challenger was i and guess then, that's true right before endorsing joe biden um and i don't know what joe's doing that's really upsetting her frankly um, right. I mean, in <laughs> fact, his 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 uh, platform was more ambitious than this. It turns out that she was just, you know, there when she resigned from the DNC and she was primarily critiquing Democrats and she slayed Kamala Harris on the <laughs> on the debate stage. Um, it turns out the thing that drew a lot of people to her was just the critic critique of Democrats and not anything substantive because now she's just making the right wing argument about democrats and all of like her aloha stands are like yeah but it's not even queen let's be clear it's not even that she's critiquing democrats she is critiquing what in never mind the 1.75 bill or whatever it is i mean if this was a 3.5 trillion dollar bill I, I presume her critique would be even double what it is now if that is not what you want as a progressive and i understand if you're a socialist, you know, a lot of this is just sort of like uh, filling potholes and, and, and you want a, a socialist revolution and you want the change in who owns. And that's and I it's a lot of that I can sign on for. But I also, as a as someone who is not a socialist, uh, I can appreciate some uh, incrementalism and stuff that has a real big material impact. But for you to criti critique in the way that she's critiquing, there is only one word for you. And you could be the dumbest person on earth who has a platform and know that. In fact, my evidence is, here's Sean Hannity. You don't sound like a Democrat to me. I hereby, you can raise your right hand, you're definitely a conservative. So. <laughs> Anyway, uh, always a pleasure, Sean. We always <laughs> always a pleasure. I Sean. wonder. 
she if, is scary. I wonder if she's like, God, that was like three weeks too soon. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, I've got, Sean. I, I'm going to have to recalibrate. Wait, let me go tweet something that might sound like I'm not quite a conservative yet. Oh, Sean, you did this too early. God, I'm <sighs> smiling to hide my rage. I wanted to elongate the heel turn, but now... You've exposed me for too much. You yes. look at the mileage that folks got out of I endorsed Bernie in 2016. Mm -hmm. Like Tulsi, also Brett Weinstein. That's his only, as far as I know, um, sort of. Uh, <laughs> Joe Rogan. Oh, yeah. Joe, Joe Rogan in the primary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Whatever. Like, and. Tulsi person who like people are like what happened she endorsed Bernie it's like before that she's trolling Obama for not using the term radical Islamic yep. terror like yep. she's always been a reactionary plant she just did a brief thing where she endorsed Bernie and I don't know what program she thought Bernie was going to uh, um, institute uh, Bernie's the one who negotiated this deal Bernie perceived the 3.5 trillion dollar deal frankly to be the capstone of his career and um, I mean, so she's so full of crap. And, 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 and the people who have like made excuses for her and said, well, it's a good thing that she's not for, you know, that she's for this sort of like Medicare for all light because it's much better. I mean, give me a point. She wasn't think, even for Medicare I for know. all. She, the, she the, said it was anti-American. Her first term in Congress, she, yeah. But then, but even before that, she wasn't a co-sponsor. Even I, before she ran. Uh, but then she signed on later when she knew she was going to I would run. also say... Um, the folks, I would particularly think people that were draping themselves as an anti-imperialist, like that's why Dorr, for instance, endorsed Tulsi over Bernie. Uh, you're giving anti-imperialism a really, really bad way name with this. It's uh, not so anti-imperialism if we use a drone strike and it's Muslims that we're yeah, hitting. It's Muslims, yeah. yeah, it's not also. And I'm in the special forces deployed in the Horn of Africa now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> look up her. Look up her. Uh, her. Where have I been? On secret mission. Yeah, maybe doing a board on to Somalia. waterboarding, which she doesn't necessarily consider to be an illegitimate torture technique. That's very anti-imperialist. She's all for peace. Aloha. Yikes. Uh, let's go to the phones. Calling from an 818 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. How are you doing? It's Dave from Jamaica. Hey. Dave from Jamaica. What's happening? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, not not too great. We're still dealing with COVID. Um, still under 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 twenty percent vaccinated due to hesitancy and whatnot. Wow. But, yeah, it, but I, I think um, to cl clarify, I think how I describe hesitancy a little more broadly. You, you of course, you have people who are completely um, um, what you call it now into conspiracy stuff that they get from the internet. Propagandized, yeah. Downstream, and then you have the downstream from that caused by their chit chat because they, those guys can't help but spread it, right? Yeah. You have people who hear that stuff and they get kind of skittish. And I think that kind of describes what's going on down here. But it is frustrating because like my sister's a doctor and she caught COVID and breakthrough, in, breakthrough infection because of this hesitancy that's going on but she's fine but it's is it, there are there vaccines is the there enough vaccines available vaccines are available it's people just from people i don't trust it to oh, I'll, I'll do it later type of attitude mm -hmm. so that's what's kind of going on down here <laughs> and how so is, the is the government is the government is the government uh like attempting to get more aggressive Lots in terms of ads of on the radio yeah, lots of ads on the radio telling people, hey, get vaccinated, do it, protect your family, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, once that, once these kind of conspiracy stuff get out there, it's kind of hard to, you know, put the genie back in the bottle Yeah, <laughs> for some folks. Uh, and it's only when people catch it, I think I've seen people kind of have a change of heart. And even then, that's not guaranteed. Oy. But it is frustrating. But, um, outside the doom and gloom, <laughs> uh, let me go to your guys' doom and gloom. But um, have you? Are you worried that the Democrats up there are going to do the same strategy of um, 
over blaming wokeness prefer and then trying to do the whole Republican light strategy again. Yeah. Because it seems that's what they're kind of setting themselves up yeah. for. Yep. I don't over blaming wokeness. Name. Over blaming wokeness is really just a way for them to kind of soft pedal or or not engage with anti racism. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> that's I mean. Yeah, because that's uh, you've seen the poll that Jacobin has done recently, right? Yeah, where, where you got, it kind of yeah. goes into the weeds. Yeah. While I, I think the most disturbing thing I've seen in that is um, maybe the working class is reflexive um, anti-immigrant stuff. Because you see kind, kind of something with this hemisphere in general. But the I think... I guess this is my critique of AOC. I do, not that she's a bad person or anything, but her instincts seem a little off. And I do, at least from my experience, the way she talks about stuff, not that I'm, it's not anti-woke or anything like that, but it, I guess it comes off as, um, I wouldn't say, how can I say it? It does, it, it kind of rubs people the wrong way. I, is, I wish it could, um, I wish she just had better instincts with this type of stuff where she wouldn't, she doesn't. Like, what are you talking about specifically? Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, like, I, I, you know, we, we were hmm. pretty uh, clear on like the tax the rich stuff. I thought mm -hmm. that was a little bit muddled, frankly. Uh, she would have been better outside what? those, that thing. But what are you, but what are you talking about specifically? Like, like I can't tell if you're saying that she's like, too woke or, or not woke enough. Oh, no, it's not that it's not. It's not too woke or not woke enough, but I guess her need to, I guess, her, I think it's her instinct that she fears that she's going to drive away more liberal voters if she does um, put, say things plainly. You know what I mean? Like no. what, what you give with the example of your clip before, right? Where you know, the need yeah. to say, well, America, you know, that instinct. I wish she could get rid of that because I think that's hindering her a lot. Well, <laughs> Where, but if I mean, at the same keep things plainly, people would take her more. What do you mean plainly, serious. though? I wouldn't say. You mean like, if she was um, no need to sugarcoat stuff? Oh right? well, I don't know. Do you really think that there is like that that she's going to expand her her uh, you know? It's really just a question of like, look, she is the most well known or one of the most well known Democratic politicians in the country, right? Mm -hmm. She is the most powerful um, fundraiser that largely Democrats have. I mean, largely. Um, and, and certainly within the Progressive Caucus and certainly within the squad uh, and, and, and beyond. And mm -hmm. I don't know if, if, if Ilhan Omar comes to me and says, Sam, your value to us is to go out there and be able to raise money for candidates without uh, corporate interests. And your value to mm -hmm. us is to be able to reach people beyond where we can reach. That's what we want you to do. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. we want you to do in terms of your national profile. I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't know if I'd be like, well, I don't want to say the platitudes. I, I mean, I, it's just like, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, like, I mean, I, I just like, you know, what role is she fulfilling? Like, what is the value of her doing what you're talking about? I can come up with the value of her doing like, you know, sugarcoating some stuff uh, in some instances. I mean, I think like, you know, we critiqued what she said in that particular moment because I think it runs contrary. She should be there needs to be somebody on the inside there who's a politician who is supportive of the, what the protesters are saying which is that this has been fundamentally, um, you know, underdone. Now, I haven't seen everything she said. She may have said that, and that's the part that, that came out where she basically, you know, but um, so it, it's sort of hard to assess oh, I, fully I, what she did. But 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 I think just broadly I, I think, speaking. I think you clarifying. Oh, sorry. I'm saying I think you kind of clarified it for me. I think what I'm trying to say is that sometimes her instinct to sugarcoat are, is not really helping her. That's what I'm saying. It seems like I'm not sure that like she's channel. always she. You know, let's remember. I don't know if she needs help. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know that she's in this. She doesn't need re-election help in her district. And so, no, clear, yeah. yeah. So what does she do? What is she using her political power for? And and if you if you mm -hmm. if you assume that she is mm -hmm. there's an understanding and that she has an understanding. I don't know. If this is the case. But if you assume 
that she understands that she has she is a you know sort of like a one in a million type of democratic politician you know compare this frankly to like obama <laughs> um mm. who used all of his skill set always for his ends period yep but if you were to say right, like right, right. what would aoc do what could aoc do to enhance the power of the progressive caucus I don't I don't know that she would be doing a lot different, frankly, and she might be doing it at her expense with certain elements of her support in the past. I don't know. Appreciate the call, Dave. Thanks. All right. Thanks for the call. Thanks. Call from a 249 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Dad. How you doing, man? Call James Cash. Long Dad, time no. No. How you been, brother? <laughs> How you having, been? Having good. Why don't you tell everyone where you're calling from? Um, I am calling at the moment from Sudbury, Ontario. However, mm. Jamie is picking me up from the airport on Thursday, and I will be headlining at Wonderville Friday night. In, uh, in Brooklyn, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. DJ. Yep. Wow. Yes, Jake Morris will be there. Trevor from Champagne Sharks will be there. Amanda Yee will be there. Uh, my co-host. And former Majority Report fan, and now my co-host, Nia Cola, will be there. Um, Wait, trying to get my former my fan. Majority Report fan? Yeah, so you had you had an economist in your ranks, an actual, legitimate economist, like full-on economist that hardly ever spoke or talked. But I saw the talent, and I'm like, yo, there needs to be more trans women out here than just ContraPoints. Let me grab her. And so I've been mentoring her the last year, and now she's a host, of, host with me on my non-politics show, log off already but she's also going to be i forgot which university she's giving a talk on mmt for 45 minutes at a university because why ben burgess was nice enough to put her on as a favor to me he argued with her about mmt it was recognized it was good i pulled one of your fandom right from Mondays. wait so she's no longer a fan of the show i didn't say that sam but oh okay you know when, when you said former fan of the show it makes it seem like she's not a fan anymore because we're playing on sam we're playing on the same field now she's a colleague Oh, I understand. Ah. I understand. I understand. I understand. All right. You know, All right. She's, she's Kali. Okay. I got you, know? you. I got you. So, yeah, I will be headlining on Friday in Brooklyn. And then Saturday, you know, Jake Flores, he's going to come to the crib. My girl Foxy Jasbo going to come through. And uh, to be honest, we're going to be drinking and hanging out in the hotel room with non-alcoholic beer and no drugs. All right. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. I am, I am sorry that I will be missing uh, Friday night. It is, uh, it is movie night around my parts. You got to my, my brother. Good. Uh, and exactly, <laughs> I've got to, got to deal with my other son. Uh, and so, so Sam, did you see the um, footage I sent you? I have not seen the footage you've sent me. Oh, 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 yeah. oh, oh yes, yes. When you were up uh, uh, talking to some anti-vaxxers. Yes, yes. So I, see that. Uh, I know you're familiar with the writer Brooke Pinkowski, correct? Uh, I, I think so. Yes. Well, she's a damn good writer. But anyway, so she's been at Huffington Post. She's been at CNN. She used to um, work down the hall from Tucker Carlson. She said he was an asshole back then. She used to work around Larry Elder, said he was a piece of shit. Hmm. She got all kinds of cool stories. But anyway, she's a writer who writes on, like, hate and stuff like that. And me and my buddy Kareem Assad, we're at the forefront of the Canadian anti-mask movement. We track all, everything that they do. Um, we know who the characters are, et cetera. Um, there's so much that happened up here in Canada and pretty much, like, I started partnering with Kareem, I want to say around July. And that's why I've been, that's why I was on, you know, Humanist, you know, my man, shout out to my man, Mike from Humanist uh, over at Means TV with me, because, you know, I'm still a correspondent for them. Like, we've been, I've been covering that, and that's why I was on the show. And, like, uh, you know, I was on TYT last week for the first time, shout out to him. And it's just like, I've just been at the forefront and just covering it. I love it. That's awesome. Congratulations. Sam, did you, do you see every time when I ask questions how they reply to me? Um, like we, like they're a little bit defensive. Also, Sam, um, yeah. I really don't like when these anti-maskers get, try to bully my colleague, you know? Yeah. Like, um, if you saw there was a point where I, I um, we're not on Peacock right now. I can curse, right? Yeah. You can swear. I have to be honest, Sam. Like, and you're still, um, uh, you know, I'm, you're still on the majority report. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't I, I understand that, Sam, but. Like Frankly, uh, my colleague is five foot two Palestinian woman, and when these uh, boomer white dudes get close to her and act like they want to, you know, get in their face, I might have to slap the shit out of them. I'm trying to conduct an interview. 
Well, I understand. No, I appreciate that. I understand. Yeah, yeah, like I said, you saw that, Sam, and I, and I, and I know my dad's proud of me. Well, I, I, I think it's important. I just also, you know, uh, make sure that uh, you, you're restrained and then you, and, and maybe try and <laughs> maybe try and not uh, not have to say, you know, uh, you know, the the, the S word. I apologize, Sam. It's not how just, old dad. this man sounds. <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, Sam, Sam, will you be going to my bris ceremony on Saturday morning? I will not be going to your bris ceremony, but I'm, uh, <laughs> I, that is actually very low on my list of things to see. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, so, so, go ahead. so wait. So where can people get uh, tickets for uh, your your DJ debut? I guess sure. in Brooklyn. Sure. They can go to, uh, um, you know, I've DJed many clubs before, but this is the first time I've ever headlined. Okay. You know what enough. I mean? So yeah. um, they can get it at wonderville.nyc and it's going to be with um house of feelings shout out to my man matt fasano over at house feelings records which i am an artist um and yeah i'm going to be djing out there and then i have some other stuff happening in toronto things like that like sam i have some good news and bad news for you okay you want to say which one do you want first uh g- give me the uh the bad, bad, the bad news first. and i'm good the, the bad news is um well, frankly, I've replaced Megan McCain as my crush with Michelle Fiore. I'm moving up. Okay. I don't know if I know, you know? who Michelle Fiore is, but... Oh, you isn't... don't know? No. Matt, put him on. Tell him who she is. I know you know. He doesn't either. He don't... Uh, yeah, yeah. One of y'all Google Michelle Fiore's video. She was the one with the um, rather curvy, milf age Republican... Oh. Who was um, shooting bottles, talking about critical race theory, and I don't like Joe Biden. Uh, he got out of a truck. Okay, right. okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, that's not oh, yeah. that. I have to say, does not strike me as as bad news. I'm I'm happy for you. That I, you I, frankly, found a new. Uh, I mean, Sam. Yeah. She appears to support gay marriage and legalization of weed, and she's like, I don't want Joe. I don't like Joe Biden. I'm like, I don't like him neither, baby. Let's go. All right. And uh, what's the good news? No. Good news is. This is my final call because Sam, I simply don't have time to sit on hold no more. All right. Well, I'm I'm happy to that that I'm happy for you, in that regard. Thank you. All right. Now, man. what would you should know is is that Andre Gomez absolutely would like to speak with you and would like to you know he'd like to holler at you. Um, should okay. he email you or um, how how should he get at you? Uh, send an email to Majority Reporters at Gmail. Sure. So also, so Sam, I do want you to know. Yes, I will absolutely be speaking to Glenn Greenwald, and don't worry, I'll never abandon my father. I got you. <laughs> well, listen, I just want you to know that uh, I, I tell this to all my children. Um, you live your life, <laughs> and uh, it, you know, don't you don't worry about dad. Dad's fine. Uh, he can take care of himself. You just live the best life that you can live. That's the important thing. Um, Call James Cash, everybody. Appreciate the call, man. No problem. Thanks, Sam. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 There he is. Yeah, packed Friday night. Wow. I wish I could go. Honestly, honestly, I really do. Where in Brooklyn is it happening? <sighs> oh, okay. But they, first off, I probably wouldn't, there's probably an age cutoff, I would imagine. Uh, but, <laughs> but secondly, I've got to. Uh, you have the kids. kids. I get the kids. Yeah, the kids. Well, there's like arcade games and stuff there, unless this is a different one. I probably couldn't. I probably couldn't take Saul. Uh, Colin from a four four three area code. Dad, why am I allowed to stay up until midnight? Hey, uh, this is Ted from Brooklyn, New York. New Ted York. from Brooklyn, New York. What's on your mind? Um, so first off, absolutely love the show. Uh, I wanted to ask a question because I don't hear this being talked about very much, and I think it's almost uh, the most important thing we can be discussing right now so uh you know as, as i think about the most fundamental issues our country faces today just the broken and, and utterly dysfunctional political system increasingly unfair election laws and voter suppression you know widespread conflicts of interest mistreatment of workers resistance to minimum wage reform disappearance of the middle class growing wealth divide all the tax loopholes for the wealthy uh you know health care pharmaceutical costs it seems to me that every single one of those problems is worsened significantly or, or honestly really anchored to corporate influence and the role of money in politics. And, you know, said differently, I can't think of a way to truly resolve any of the really big issues uh, I just mentioned without removing or at least reducing the influence of corporate interest in money in politics. It strikes me that 
you know, if you think about it and sort of, you know, map each of those issues, virtually all roads lead back uh, to that. Uh, and I know it, it's an inherently tough egg to unscramble at this point because now we have sort of a fox guarding the hen house situation. But I would hope that, you know, more people would at least talk about this. I, um, yeah, I mean, I think I mean, it's interesting how that that topic, you know, that's what Bernie ran on in 2016. And that topic has largely just left the building, um, partly because the Supreme Court has made that. There, there's two reasons why it doesn't get the attention that it used to. And, Warren and I, also I, ran on it, you know, to less to with, with less success. I mean, she yeah. had that anti-corruption rally in Washington Square Park. Yeah, there's two things. One is um, that we have a Supreme Court that is never going to allow our government has constituted now to limit the participation of money in our politics. The other thing though, is that in the past five, six years, I mean, really it started with, with Howard Dean, but in the past really five or six years, last decade, let's just say the ability of politicians to finance their campaigns in a competitive way through small dollar donations has dramatically changed. And so the disparity, at least within the context of elections, is not as great as it was. I, however, do believe that the problem we have is, is, the same, is, is fundamentally you know, more or less the same, which is that we have oligarchs, that we have a plutocracy now, where we had a plutonomy, and then it, that, that divergence, the discrepancy in economic power, tumbles into uh, a discrepancy in political power. And I, I think there are things that even like the Biden administration could do unilaterally. And then there's all stuff we could do uh, legislatively. Like, I think we need to have a wealth tax in this country. Like, I think like we almost, almost had one in the Build Back Better. I don't know if we're going to get it, but like a billionaire tax. Like, I mean, I actually think first we start with eliminating the billionaires literally eliminating them, taking their assets. I would also do things like um, changing the, the tax structure so that capital gains are not uh, favored by our tax system over wage, wage taxation. How does that, if, how does, yeah. the, I'm in favor of all of those things, including a wealth tax, but I think, you know, there's also immense corporate corruption moneyed interests which is separate from individuals yeah well i mean these corporations are 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 run by people who want to make a ton of money <laughs> and yeah and so if you if you change the way that capital gains is structured then you don't you don't have the same reasons for let's say the ceo to be paid in stocks i would also disallow stock buybacks and i would uh, uh, because i think that w there's a lot of um that disincentivizes corporations from functioning in a way that it, you know takes into account the community or uh, or long term health of their their company, which is re reliant on on their workers. They don't care because you've got people who are 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 running these things. Basically, they've got a side bet going on, and the side bet is you know. How can I inflate the value of my own personal stock portfolio, which includes a bunch of stock from this company I'm working at? And how can I do it to pay out in four and a half years when my compensation package is due? And my compensation is structured that way because I only pay 20% tax on that as opposed to you know whatever else I would be paying if, if it wasn't uh, structured that way. I, I think you need to, und and how else do you undermine corporate power? Antitrust. You, you break them all up. These big behemoths, you break them up into tinier pieces and you diminish the power that they have. That's the yeah, way that we I, could do this. I, I can... agree with everything you're saying. I think it just comes back to the point I made, sort of a chicken and egg thing, you know, and, and a fox guarding the hen house issue. You know, how do you sort of unravel all of those things well there's there's that. there's there's some real antitrust stuff happening in the biden administration right now like i mean that's the thing you got to look at yep. things that like we're, we're not relying on um you know joe manchin uh for antitrust is you know the department of justice is has been has really been beefed up in terms of an antitrust perspective it's going to take a little time because you know the 
four years of, of the Trump administration, I don't think people fully understand what it does to the infrastructure of these places. I also yeah. would would yeah. add that I think you know I'm I've I share your your um, analysis about how corruption has affected the United States, but I, like over the past few years, it's allowed me to zoom out a little bit more, and the way that our corruption manifests itself is also just it's a function of how capitalism exists in the United States, um, and it's particular to the United States for that reason. So I think if you view it as as a consequence of the way we've structured our, our economic system in this country, I think it can give a little bit more of a systemic perspective. Yep. Appreciate the call. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. All right, we got time for one more phone call. We got a lot of people hanging on the phone. Um, Go with this one. Calling from a 503 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? On the phone for almost 60 plus minutes. <laughs> uh, hi, this is, is this me? Is it you? Uh, well, I guess it is. Uh, this is Jared from uh, Portland, Oregon. Jerry from Portland, Oregon. Jared. Jerry. From Portland, Oregon. Jared. Thank you, Emma. Um, yeah. I listen. And uh, <laughs> well, I would expect that from mm. the uh, resident Satanist vegan on the show. Mm, yes. Um, it's it's all for nefarious <laughs> purpose. Uh, I just had something to call in. Uh, I just uh, had the uh, sorry, a bit nervous. Uh, You're doing great. Sam, I just wanted to um, ask, as as someone who uh, just recently welcomed my first child into the world, you know. Whoa. All, yeah. <laughs> um, when do you get sleep? Is that what you want to know? Uh, When's the next time you're going to sleep? I can tell you. <laughs> Never. Please. Ne never. All right. Your child is now training you to wake up uh, early in the morning and to get no sleep, and then you don't you don't get fixed. You know, it never comes back. You never get sleep. Like Jesus it. Christ. Yep. Great. Look at the bags yeah, under my eyes. Talk about... Look at the bags under my eyes. Go back. Go back uh, f 14 years ago. The there were no bags under my eyes. All right. What's the other question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how. Uh... I mean, in, as you've as your relationship with your own children has has developed, how do you with everything that's going on and all the uh, the gradual slide downhill we seem to be walking to, walking down? How do you uh, how do you talk to them about that? Well, I mean. I don't talk to them about the gradual slide downhill. I don't put it that perspective. You I mean, don't for instance, implant nihilism in there. Yeah, in there. yeah I mean, right, right. look, you and I don't know what the world is going to be like in 20 years. We don't know. Uh -huh. I have some suspicions, <laughs> but, you know, like, um, we, we, we don't know. And so yeah. I, I, you know, I, I mean, the weird thing is, like, my daughter, she's like, I'm, you know, my friends are having a party. She told me this a couple months ago. Uh, when is it? It's on September 11th. And I'm like, uh, dude, what? And I like, I realized like, t that, you know, that was, that was 20 years ago. Yeah. No concept of like, you know, whatever. They had no concept. And um, like, I feel like I don't need to, you know, and obviously she knows about uh, uh, September 11th, but um I think it is best for you to um, to teach them the, the the history of the country without a doubt, but I don't think you should project upon them that there's a slow, you know, degradation of everything and it's all falling apart. I think you just need to tell them about what they need to do to make the place better. That's what's bad. That's that's the way you do this. Right, you give them right. a vision of what the the country could be, 
and you should say there's going to be challenges and this and that, but um, I mean, I think like, you know, let them deal with it when they're adults as to like, you know, assessing where we are, like, you know, sort of instill in them. I mean, this is what I try and do is I try just to instill in them, like the idea that they're citizens and they have a responsibility to other citizens. And to the extent that other citizens don't feel like they have a responsibility to them or others, those are just, those are just, you know, losers essentially. And they're not good people. And you have to, part of being a citizen is that you, your relationship is not to necessarily any individual citizens, but to the idea of a citizenry. And, um, there are things you can do to enhance that. And I feel like if you give them some just like basic, basic skills and a worldview, th they can fill in the details because you don't know what it's going to be like in 10 years. I mean, you can take a guess, but I, you know, we don't know, but I think you just got to inst yeah. instill them the sort of skill set that they need to deal with whatever comes. All right. Right. Well, you know, it should be like, hey, you, you know, the good old days. The good old days when things were, you know, I mean, come on. I grew up during the Reagan yeah. era. I mean, that was, that sucked. I mean, in many respects, I will say this. All the things you outlined are, are true. But in terms of, like, the body politic, there I, I see a lot more encouragement. You know, I'm encouraged by where, you know, people are today more so than I was 15 years ago or frankly 40 years ago and so now i that may or may not translate into you know good things for society but there, there's there's right. you, if you want to be optimistic you can find at least some some stuff so hang in there get some sleep but you're never going to sleep again congratulations i will tell you this though <laughs> thank you is it a boy or a girl that you that you have it is a boy okay then it's going to take another six months. But by the time your boy is six and a half or seven, you're going to gain back like like an hour a months. day, maybe. Six and a half months. No, no. Years. Right. Years old. Oh. Years old. Yeah, no, no. You got six or seven years to put in, and okay. it's going to be. Um, and uh, But that's it. But if you have a second kid, then you're going to have to wait for that kid to, 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 to hit that age, too. So. Hang All in right. there. I don't know if I can handle that. Oh, Thank you can you. handle and, uh, it. I'm pretty sure you can handle it. And uh, I just wanted to say, um, I became a member about two years ago now, um, and just thank you guys so much for the work that you do, and uh, yeah, part right, of well, my day every day. Great. Appreciate the call. <laughs> Thanks so Hang much. Hang in there. Get some sleep. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, like I- Imagine I, sleep one more time. Well, here's the thing, is that like, you know, on one hand, the irony of that call was like, you know, should, should I tell my children about like how, how um, you know, how- <laughs> We're on this downhill trajectory. And yet I refrained from saying that to him. I'm not going to say to him like, what? oh, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better, buddy. Well, like, I think you said the downhill trajectory thing, but say like, it's always been that way. Yeah. I watch. I wonder, you know, if we're feeling like things are never going to get better, how many times did people perceive that? Go to 1920. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Or There's so many, so many examples with 1840. Yeah. You just don't know. And you some just of it's just more acute because we have access to everything that's going on in the world that's at exactly every possible what it is. time. So it, it, it just put that into perspective as right. well. I mean, people could not have been terribly psyched in the onset of World War II. No, I bet that was pretty, pretty bleak then too. And and also, I mean, you know, I mean, so. Uh, I, I mean, I've said this before, but like. <laughs> Prior to, prior to, even if you go back and look at Occupy, like just the, the, the language that people had, the understanding and the sort of critique of society that people had, I mean, it's developed so much mm -hmm. in terms of our politics. It's just that we also exactly have the exact same leadership as we did 10 years ago and also 15, 20 years ago. I yes. mean, it's sort of stunning. That's why I like Leahy, I hope, like, you know, some other people get the message. All right, yeah, let's do some IMs and we'll get out of here. Uh, gnome. Ho, ho, ho. Hey, hello there, old chum. I'm not an elf. I'm a gnoblin. I'm a gnome, and you've been gnomed. The hmm, shadow. Much to think about. <laughs> the only founding father that stands up to modern scrutiny is Thomas Paine. 
Mm -hmm. uh, turn left. Town to uh, turn left to win. Why don't more progressive CEOs and founders who own businesses pay high attractive, pay attractive high wages? We have very few companies like Gravity Payments who pay everyone in their company a minimum salary of 70K. TYT, for example, has the big divide in the way that Anna Kasparian gets paid compared to the production technical crew who do the hardest jobs. I, I, I'm not familiar with what the TYT structure is. Um, you know, I don't know. Wait, what is the point of this? Why don't we have more companies that pay uh, everyone a minimum salary of seventy thousand? I, I I just I don't I don't even know the numbers. I mean, um, greed. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, also, I'm not sure how if I'm not aware of what Anna gets paid. I'm not sure how if you how you're aware of it. Um, guys, have you seen that Freedom to Vote Act? I mean, and, and I would also just say like. If you can only come up with uh, the example of TYT for something like this, it may be a little bit narrow. Might be. We may need a, a, a bigger uh, set of things. Might be. But, uh, guys, have you seen that Freedom to Vote ad, Act ad uh, electile dysfunction yet? Amazing. I'll well, check that out. Uh, we look for that um, electile dysfunction.com or something like that. It's not coming up for me. Fierce deity. I'd like to see some kind of punishment for Mike Pence and Kristen Cinema, where they have to spend eternity together. Him worried the whole time that she, he's alone with a woman and her depressed that nobody else will see how quirky and random her outfit is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mitt Romney's going to be like crying as the, the best friend who doesn't get the girl in that rom-com scenario. Jay from New North Carolina. I'm not union. I don't really know people who are, but I've been watching some of these strikes play out, and it seems that the negotiating committee seems more interested in making a deal than reading their unions on what workers want. It seems like they make modest deals that ultimately get struck down instead of taking more bold and militant demands. There is no doubt in my mind that union leadership is lagging behind union membership in terms of this. In fact, I mean, and I would say it's not just the ones that have been going on strike. Like, you know, uh, I feel like the uh, union leadership of the teachers unions were completely caught flat footed during uh, the couple of years back when we had the red state revolt uh, of teachers. And um, and I, Weingarten just went public um, to say vote in the first standoff with progr the progressive caucus where progressives held strong on infrastructure. She was saying that the that we you know vote for the bipartisan infrastructure bill first or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know where unions. I don't know if that's in her union in interest, uh, you know, interests or not in terms of un where unions were on that. And that's sort of a different. It's a different question as to whether the union leadership is in t is is aware of just the level of anger that is in the union and their willingness to to fight. Now I can understand why union leadership might not want to get out ahead of where their 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 members are but they should have a better sense of the level of militancy of their unions i mean the, the, you know not all unions there's there's problems it's I mean, the same sclerotic leadership problem that the democrats have basically i would imagine that there is a similar dynamic similar like um rolodex and you know the relationships going on there yep i just brought up that example because uh, on the peacock show we did an interview i did an interview with uh jeff shirky of in these times magazine about this very topic uh, on how union leadership was undermining progressives on reconciliation and wine garden in particular and some unions uh leadership has very close relationships with the old democratic guard um and not even like Pelosi, but conservative Democrats too, as well, um, who've been there for a while, like Steny Hoyer as well. Um, and so my sense of when that happened in early October, late late September was they were the 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 conservative Democrats were calling on these union leaders to to help circle the wagons for them and try to get this passed. Um, but but the disconnect, I don't know, it's it's very real, and it's the same reason Weingarten in 2016 jump to endorse hillary before the rest of her uh no i i think actually the reason why she did that um was because they got so burned during the obama administration they were late to come into obama and by the time they did they they lost this battle of corporate, she had a relationship with, with hillary for 
I think that's the, I, I think that's the case. But I also think that they were like, we need to be first in line in this organization. I mean, I spoke to both her and her VP at the time, and the VP was re regretted it, if I remember him correctly. I can't I can't remember his name now. I mean, he regretted it, but they but he, he said that we were also you know because I think he was more uh, of a Bernie supporter. But he said we 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 were burned under the Obama administration. Because by the time we lined up behind Obama, um, all of the corporate education reformers were there ahead of us. And I don't know if that would have made a difference That's or not. That's such an indictment of Obama more than the unions themselves almost at that point. Because like, okay, cool, they were late to you. Still hear the value of what they have to say over charter school advocates. Yeah, I, I mean, yes, but it wasn't it wasn't necessarily charter schools as much as it was like a corporate reformist. And, 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 and Arne Duncan had like a sort of an inside track uh, because he was from Chicago. But, but the bottom line is, is like, you know, these guys are transactional. And people get paid back for their favors. And the 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 understanding of support, you're there first. I mean, look, we, we can even see it in the context of like what we do. And if and what we do is, uh, yeah, but... I mean, and, and what we do, like, you know, the stakes are not as high. Like, you know, people protect their friends and their friends are defined by who's there for you at what time. I mean, this is, you know, the. I, I, this is in no way to defend uh, Randy Weingarten. I'm just explaining decisions that I think are made sometimes more institutionally um, that end up getting filtered through, you know, individuals. I, you have a responsibility as union leader to not be transactional in that way. Same as I think that we but have a you, responsibility in. But do but do you not? Because you have a responsibility to represent your members. Well, exactly. But if you do, aren't transactional with the people who. Um, who pay the salaries of your members, you're stuck in a, a bind. But I mean, it, that's why we saw the unions completely abandon the Working Families Party in this state, because Cuomo was like, I will F you, I will F all of you, and now that will hurt your members. Now, the, the, the problem when you don't have union leadership that understands the willingness of members to fight that's where it becomes a problem, because if, if you're not aware that your membership is willing to stay on the picket lines or is willing to go and strike, then you get into these transactional relationships and you either A, don't understand the power that you have, B, maybe you're just more concerned with maintaining the relationship uh, of, uh, you know, that you have. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a delicate balance. But take but just take infrastructure as a snapshot of it. There were pro act provisions in Build Back Better and multiple unions decided to side with Democratic leadership to say, let's pass the infrastructure, the bipartisan infrastructure first. That means more to us. Us giving conservative Democrats a win because of our relationships means more to us than backing the best track for a proposal that contains pro act provisions. Well, where do you think like I, I, like AFSME might be on that uh, on the infrastructure bill? I, I don't know. I mean, I mean I, I'm using these examples of high. Of, but but I'm know, saying what? I'm suggesting that there's probably a lot of unions out there who who were heavily invested in just the bipartisan bill because there's they, they actual are, but, jobs. Yeah, for but AFL-CIO was an example of, I think they also, their, their, uh, their top lobbyist was, or one of their presidents, I actually forget which one, but they were also a part of the effort to, to, to push uh, BIF forward first. So, I mean, I get it, but, but you would think that if leadership was more connected with its members at this point, and hopefully it will be soon. Maybe we're seeing some of the same friction that we're seeing with the Democratic base versus Democratic leadership right now. There's just no institutional that, memory, right? Right, but but prioritizing something like the PRO Act would be paramount, or any or parts of the PRO Act to strengthen union leadership when it's when it's actually about growing organized labor as opposed to just cementing your own power at the top of the shell of, of, of what that union was maybe some decades ago. I, I mean, I, I'm not sure in the, I, I, I think you, you, you would probably find stuff in the bipartisan bill that is going to end up like going to her membership more than even like the PRO Act would help, right? Because one of the few things, like if you're a public sector uh, union, like the teachers unions are, 
you're not necessarily as concerned about the ability of the union movement to unionize. I, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be in, in a broad sense. Like, you know, you, you get people like Barbara Maglioni, who was a uh, teacher's union up in uh, Massachusetts, and they had an understanding, and, and people like uh, uh, Karen Lewis in, in Chicago, who had an understanding of, like, sort of you build union power through, um, you know, uh, uh, a, a deeper relationship with the community and dealing with community issues. There are others who, uh, you know, I think are also sort of like, well, my job is I've got to just service uh, my union, period. Okay, but a for AFT, the Build Back Better with child subsidies, child care subsidies, is w infinitely more important than the h highway bill. I would, I would, I would imagine. Plus the PRO Act, which was in it at the time. It's just like, you know, I don't know. So this comes down more to a myopic maybe critique of Wine Garden's leadership, but I think it is... It, it is instructive about well i think she is definitely behind the i mean like and it's the same thing with not as no, as as attuned to where her union is she's more i don't know how you want to say conservative yeah. or uh you know less militant and and i think out of touch with uh the union in that respect it's the same thing and just last point on this it's the same thing where some unions uh who are more entrenched are not at the forefront of Single payer healthcare in the way that they should be because they see healthcare plans as organized by themselves as a, a without a doubt chip, as a bargaining chip to get people to join without a doubt. So their yeah. their interests are at cross currents to uh, uh, other uh, uh, you know some broader societal interests without a doubt. Boston brain Brian, Boston Brian. Hey, Sam, I'm a little surprised that the show in Boston isn't sold out yet. I got my tickets early just in case. Anyways, love the show. Can't wait to see you guys in person. Appreciate what you guys do. Uh, we're getting closer. Warren from Toronto. I don't know. I wanted a big place. Wilbur's got like. It looks massive. 1,100 It's the biggest place I'll ever yeah. yeah, it's big. Uh, Warren from Toronto. Emma, you were tweeting straight facts about a certain pop star. Uh, I've just always found the whole excessively trashing your exes thing as weird way to commodify relationships and heartbreak. Don't say the pop star's name or I will never... Nothing uh, wrong with a good breakup song or movie. It's just a little weird to 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 make a song and, and like about a three-month relationship 10 years later and then like the entire fan base is trashing that particular person and going after them. It's just a little weird. A little weird. Is oh, someone's still, someone's still the victim that, that, that long ago. I'm not saying. It must be Taylor Swift, right? right? Ah, damn it! Really? Are <laughs> uh, we gonna get? They're going coming here. after me now. Censor that. Censor that. Censor that. Apropos of what uh, Emma was saying, really cool says New York uh, State Teachers Union is killing the New York Health Act, single payer in New York State. Screw Wine Garden. She's totally committed to establishment Dems. Exactly. I mean, I, I I agree in the context of yeah. of Wine Garden is an individual just like but broadly speaking i think like the motivations of union leaders are complex i think there's and probably some people looking unfortunately yes i also think there was probably some uh, union heads in new york state who were just afraid of of cuomo um that's a huge part of it uh matt from indianapolis hey what's the live show ticket link again it's majority live all right uh 10 more of these jack toborg just a daily reminder that Steve Donzinger is still in prison. Lawrence O'Donnell did a segment on it recently. You guys want to give it a glance. Solidarity with Donzinger and left his best. Keep up the great work. Yeah, I saw something that Lucy Lawless did uh, reading off some uh, a letter from him the other day. Uh, Titan Taylor Green. How will Alex Jones getting swept in court business actually go due to punishing the behavior? Getting swept in court business? Uh, yeah, he. I, I haven't looked into the case, but he lost in court for uh, the defamation stuff. Oh, it'll be interesting. Three, uh, strong swim swimmer. Imagine having low fertility and posting in the chat. Hey, buddy, try sitting on some frozen peas instead. Fabucat. Yikes. No major world leaders really covered themselves in glory during COP26, not to divert blame from the U.S., but China, India, and South Africa weakened the resolution with regard to coal. Indeed. Get the chuck out. Sam, have you thought about running for Senate in Vermont? No, I don't live there. Also, COVID question. Besides refusing to attend Thanksgiving gathering with eight of my wife's unvaccinated family members, what would you recommend I say to my wife to discourage her from going? Um, I, I don't That's know. That's kind of hard. It's her if family. If she can't see the obvious reason, you're in, you're in, in trouble. 
but it's her family too, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Amazing Sam Cedar. My for, my older brother is former military who listens to Rogan and Shapiro and thinks Tulsi is the only good Democrat. There you go. White ex, white sexual chocolate. Good news in Delaware, Ohio. We elected for the first time black women. Won to city council. Went to city, and went to school council. That's good. Bad news and good news. On Saturday, some far-right people, one of whom was a neo-Nazi and couple were carrying firearms, decided to hold a White Lives Matter and white genocide rally that spurned a bunch of us of all different backgrounds to attend an emergency community meeting where we vented and planned steps to let these sorts of people know that it's not welcome to shut it down. Great. Folks can go to W, I mean, S-W-C-I, S-W-C-I, Delaware.org, uh, getting funding for a community center. If you want to help uh, that, get some donations. All right, four more. Thick Mulvaney. Oosh. Uh, everyone says government is bigger and our pockets are smaller, but no one is saying billionaires are richer and our pockets are smaller. Yes, good point. Out of state, Mena. I uh, think our progressive leaders should be out there every single day making statements to the press, explaining their bills in detail, explaining their motives and talking about their strategy. Why do they let the MSM control the narrative? The worst was Medicare for all. So many people remain confused on the simple fact that your insurance premium would go away. Instead, you'd pay less money as a tax. But you won't be paying for executive salaries, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, well, this is a big question. You know, how do you get messages out there? Uh, I, for one, have always you know believed in, in, in AM talk radio, to be honest with you, but... Rob from Dedham. Any chance y'all can get David Wengro on to discuss his and David Graeber's book, The Dawn of Everything? Yes. Will you put that in the list? I've been meaning to, to tell you that, Bradley. And the final I am of the day. Jonathan Armstead. Can we please have more of Emma doing a Tulsi impersonation? It's like Cruella DeVille reading lines from Gone Girl. She is very, very Do dis- one Disney to end it up. Desk right now yeah it's it's like i'm not good at this like you Uh, i'm not good at that oh sean (laughs) oh sean aloha sean aloha (laughs) off to do yoga and film it for (laughs) you actually really do nail her voice i can nail the deep tones and the psych psychopathy behind it oh my gosh matt Bradley, Cruella, good job today. <laughs> See you tomorrow. <laughs> it might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there.